Right, thank you everybody. I'd welcome you to the council, ordinary council meeting of today's date, 30th September. I will remind councillors um, that we are operating in, under both the COVID um, constructions. So most of our councillors are online. We have in the room, in terms of councillors, I have my Deputy Mayor, um, Councillor Nigel Belsham, and the Chair of Assets, um, Councillor Dave Wilson. We have staff, but I only mentioned one at this stage, the Chief Executive Peter Beggs is with us. We have a public forum that we will start on immediately. So I'm welcoming Paul Sharlan of the Bulls Museum and Russell Harris to be able to uh, present to us. They have sent something through to councillors and I'll ask Carol if you could uh, share that screen. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to come and see us. I know that it has been quite a long travelled route. Um, <laughs> So thank you, and thank you for um, understanding that the COVID restrictions are in place. But you have 10 minutes. How you use that time is up to you, yeah. um, but it also includes question time. Okay. Are you OK with that? Fine. Um, over to you guys. By the way, uh, for those online, normally we would start council with the council prayer. We have met this morning on another meeting. So that's all been uh, done. Gentlemen, the time is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Your Worship and fellow councillors for uh, um, asking us to make this presentation on what we consider to be a pretty exciting proposal, not just for bulls, but for the whole of the Rangitiki. As you would have seen, you would have had, had our PowerPoint presentation. Is it going to come up? Yeah, on any the second. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's in two parts. The first part being the, the Bulls Library Building and the second part being the Chris Amon statue. So just a little bit of information about the Library Building. As you, as you now know, it's, it's vacant. It's a historical place, Category 2. And the advantage of that is it does attract National Heritage Preservation Incentive Fund. So we may be able to get some funds out of them for certain things. The Memorials Register in New Zealand online record records the Bulls as, it, as the Bulls Public Library War Memorial Building. So that's got a bit of significance. The record of title under the Land Transfer Act 2017 states, in trust for the benefit of the public as a site for a public library and reading room and for the benefit of the public for other such purposes. That again fits what, what we're trying to do. And in 1917, McElwain's erected the building. And just as a bit of information, the walls are of Caramated concrete, which is chambered concrete, consists of two walls of concrete bound together at short intervals. The inner walls remain dry in all seasons, the top part of the outside of the building to be rough cast and base smooth finished interior to be wainscoted. So that's just a bit of information about the building. So our, our, our proposal or request is that the council gift to the Bulls Historical Society the building at a peppercorn rental of a dollar a year on a lease in perpetuity of 99 years. It is our intention that we're going to create a war memorial building out of the building. We're going to shift everything out of, out of the present museum down into it, to it so it becomes a dedicated war memorial. And you may or may not know, but outside the building there is already a marble archway which contains the names of all the soldiers who gave their lives in World War I who came from either Bulls or the surrounding districts. So that's, that's what that's what our intention is. We'd also like to include RNZAF, RNZAF Ohakia, and we've already had um, interest from, from Wairu Army Museum and Linton Army that if we did it, they would be quite willing to assist us what we're going to do. So it's quite a <coughs> bit of significance. The, the position of the, of the library, as you know, it is, is, um, is just down the road from the RSA, just across the road from the Bull Cenotaph, and only a few metres from, from our present museum anyway. So it's, it's very well situated. The other the, the foot traffic thing is that it's right next door to the chemists, and it's, well, it's in between the chemists and the doctors. So there's, there's people going backwards and forwards all the time. There was also a light already out there, which we could, we could easily utilise because the power's there. So if we wanted to put some nice lighting in for the statue, it's actually already there. So it... it um, it's got, a, it's got a lot of good things for it. We will be responsible for the insurance of the building, any earthquake proofing and general maintenance. And the earthquake proofing, uh, proofing I believe there was a, a report done by Kevin Connor and Associates, Kevin O'Connor, 
back in about 2013, which, as he said, I think in his report, that it's a very superficial. So we would get our own individual expert in to have a, have a look at the building and see whether there's, there's anything needs to be done. And we're quite quite positive there's people in bulls that if things need to be done, we will get plenty of assistance. There's plenty of retired builders and all sorts of people that will give us assistance. And we've already had support from the community saying that if things need to be done, we're quite happy to do it. So that's the um, that's the the uh, thing about the, the, the library. And, and again, it's as we said, it's close to the cenotaph and it's close to the RSA. So it would be a, it would be a good thing to be done for the building, and it would be great for the town and and uh, well the whole district really. So that, that's stage one. Stage two is is the Chris Amon statue, and we came to you early on. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. yeah. Another one. Right. We came to you early on about you know putting it around by the, the green space at, uh, at the town hall, but it's that's not suitable. We've decided now this is this is a far better place to put the statue, and if you look at if you go on to the statue where we are. Yeah, that's what, that's what it's going to look like. <coughs> and if you've seen any of the um, the work that, that Matt Goldie has done throughout New Zealand, he is absolutely amazing of some of the stuff he's, he's done. It's just outstanding work. So that's that's a, 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 um, an artist's vision of what it could look like. Take away all the grass, put a nice concrete wall up behind it, have that plaque a little bit closer, and that's the present lighting, and, and we'd have it there, which... When you look at it, there's plenty of room for it. It's good for passing traffic, people taking photographs. And on the other side, involving the community and setting up the other side as a nice community space. We, we believe there's some, um, there's some memorial roses that would have to stay, but if we involve the community, it could look, could look quite spectacular. So that, that's the proposal for... for um, putting on my glasses. That's the proposal for Chris... The other thing is that, that um, Russell and myself are in, involved at this moment with an, a, um, discussions with Toyota New Zealand, who have actually approached us and said that how could they help? And we've put a proposal to them, but until we get anything further, we can't go any, any further down the track, but they're certainly interested in, in helping us do something. So um, that's really about the, the other thing. There's, there's, a couple, there's a couple of things that, if you think about the making the, the building into war memorial, it's dedicated to fallen soldiers in the war. If you think the other way, if we have the Chris Amon statue out the front, that's a, that's a memorial to a, a person that's achieved greatness right throughout the world in the motor industry. And he comes from Bulls, so there's another recognition too. So we've talked to the family. The family are absolutely thrilled with the idea of having it there. And as you come around the corner, it will be there. So, yeah, I mean, how many, how many minutes have we got left? Very <laughs> Three. Um, if, Three. If you want Russell to speak, he needs to do so now. Yeah, okay. yeah. Right, yeah. Let's jump up. Uh, looking at it, as you see it now, in no way does it detract from the existing building. Um, that's the idea right through. On the left-hand side, that the rose garden would be expanded to go right round in front of the building. That... Uh, the building would remain virtually as is. There would be upgrades, you know, with painting and uh, et cetera. But it's a very, very exciting opportunity to um, put a lot of ticks over various things. One, saving a very historic building of great significance to the town, that the, it gives the Bulls Museum an opportunity to expand which they're very short of space, and the I, the concept of moving the military side into that building is a very key element um, as well, that it gives us a wonderful home for the statue. Resolves a lot of problems. We're well down the road as far as the statue goes, with costings, designs, everything is ready to go. And I think it'll be a great thing to have it right in the middle or enhance the CBD, the bull CBD, very, very critical part of it. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. We only have a couple, two or three minutes left. Are you happy to take some questions? Yep. Uh, first of all, I presume that you've got full endorsement from the museum committee as yep. such. Thank you. Yes. Councillors, uh, questions, please. <coughs> No. 
I must, I must uh, tell you that I've warned council that we've got an incredibly full agenda today, yes. <laughs> yeah. and I've just uh, threatened them with life and death. And <laughs> so, look, thank you. We should, um, you are can contemplating this in a paper to you today. Yes, yeah. yes. This will come up as a consideration in a paper today. Okay. Um, we should be able to give you a, an indication as of the end of today as to what the, the wishes of council are. Brilliant. Because we, I mean, our, our closing closing statement was going to be in conclusion. All, all we'd like is the ticket of approval to go ahead, so we can actually. And I've and I've, I've summarised it by saying a dream can come become a reality. Okay. So that's the, that's what we're looking for. So if we could, it'd be good. Gentlemen, thank you very much thank you. for your for your time. Thank you, everyone. All right, we'll get out of here. <laughs> Uh, Delwyn, we've got you online. Are you able to hear us? Well done. Thank you. Yeah, can hear you good, Andy. Okay, thank you, Delwyn. Um, I'm not sure if you heard the, the time frame yep. around 10 minutes, including questions. Yep. Um, I'll get you to introduce yourself. That is not part of the 10 minutes, and you're free to go. Hey, um, kia ora everybody, mauri ora kia tato. Um, I'm just going to get straight into it, Andy. Cool. So um, I think uh, you were all present at the first uh, presentation where I introduced you to the calibre of the artists working in this project. Um, the other thing that I highlighted was um, I'd also um, expressed a desire to look at the whole um, external area. And um, I thank you for that, for... for um, considering that anyway. So can we go straight to the PowerPoint, please? Later. <clears throat> so while we're waiting for that, I'll just carry on talking. Um, so I just want to introduce you to our kaupapa, or the window that we're looking through as um, Ngāti Parewahawa artist. Can we go to the second slide? So, so the window that we're looking through is kaitiakitanga and um, guardianship. And I think this fits nicely with this new building and this new space. And what I just want to um, talk about is that we are all kaitiaki. We are all guardians of our environment. Um, <clears throat> and the three areas that we are looking at um, is the um, pathway adjacent to the town centre the bus lane entrance and exit, and the small garden um, that leads from the pathway um, to the small garden area. Um, can we move to the to the next one? So um, <clears throat> Rewati has been looking at um, how he's going to adorn the bus lane entrance and exit. The, um, installation on your right hand side there is a piece of work that he had done about four or five years ago and this is what we're looking at um, in regards to these two areas, the entrance and the exit of the bus lane. So when buses enter the Waharoa or the gateway to the bus lane, they will be greeted by Pare Wahawaha and she will watch over all that enter the mat te Matapihi. So that's her guardianship there. When buses leave Te Matapihi, they will be seen off by Kupe. Now, Kupe was an explorer, a navigator, um, which fits in nicely here as well. Um, and he will guide them safely to their final destination. Both installations will be mounted on a platform and both figures will be color-coded steel, like the one that you see um, highlighted in this slide here. Can we move to the next one, please? So this is what we have planned for the entrance. Um, so the top um, plan there, where you see the um, Dalzell Street and the bus opposite that first bus there is where we're looking at placing Pare Waha Waha. And we're looking at that as a, as a waharo or a gateway into the space. So like I said, she will uh, watch over everybody that comes into Te Matapihi. The bottom um, plan, uh, where the first bus stop sign is, is we're looking at placing kupe there. 
So when people leave, they will be seen off by Kupi. Um, can we move to the next slide? So um, PIP will also be looking at, we'll be looking at three Perspex suspended installations, which um, will embellish the pathway adjacent to the town centre. Each installation will represent, one will represent the Rangitike River, the other one will represent the Ruahine Ranges and Ohine Puhiawe. Ohine Puhiawe is where Parewahawaha is situated. Each installation will be engraved at the top, while the body of the work will be perforated. Each panel is representing a person wearing a kākahu or cloak, and the makeup of a kākahu shows movement and connections, and that's what we're hoping to matapihi will be to everyone that comes through it. Um, it it's, also to be, it's also a garment that's been worn for protection. So these perspex um, installations will represent that. Can we move to the next slide, please? So here are the three installations. This is just the artist impression at the moment, but it's going to be sort of close to it. The, um, the top part will be the last um, slide that you saw with the hair and stuff. That will be placed on these, and these are the colours that the artist is looking at. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I just, just wanted to show you that. And can we move to the next slide? So I just want to introduce you all to Hayley Kiriyama. The Kiriyama Fano is a well-known Fano in Rangitike Manawatu, Hura Whenua. Um, Hayley has taken over from the artist that I've um, formally introduced you to. Um, he had Fano um, mahi going on that he needed to complete, so he withdrew, and we were lucky enough. Um, Hayley stepped up. So Hayley is a graduate of Te Wānango Aotearoa. Um, his practice is entrenched in his cultural knowledge. Haley was lucky enough to be one of the last students under his uncle, who is a well-known carver, Kelly Kiriyama, um, also known as Fitu Marama Kiriyama. So I just wanted to introduce Haley to you. And as you see, there's the pathway that Pip will be adorning. Um, at right at the end, there's a small garden area. That's where the po fina will will be um, placed. Um, thanks to Andy, um, Haley got to have a look at two po or, or two totara logs. One wasn't any good, and he believes the other one is. He never got to go out to site it due to lockdown, to, due to COVID, um, but he's already started drawing um, for the po fina. The po fina for us is very significant as, as it will be um, our grounding or it will consolidate us there being, being the totara. Um, yeah, so I'm open to any, any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, questions from councillors. So the, the photographs, um, were they clear enough to be able to understand them? And uh, I, I note uh, Clifford um, as Kamatua, uh, you're online. Welcome to Chambers. But um, so, the, so a couple of those logs were suitable. Uh, one log was Andy. One one had too much. Um, Decay and stuff like that. So um, Haley, Haley will will connect back with you to let you know which one it was. Thank you, and, and I understand there was a possible request for another one from um, our northern iwi. Was that correct? Oh, I can't talk for them. Sorry. Okay. Dave, yeah, I've just question. just got just got a quick question. So, and and understanding where. You're going to have uh, a coupe at the at the at the exit and Parawahawa at the um, at the front. Yeah. On the actual green space itself, which is the significant corner section, unless I'm misread, there's nothing on that space itself. It's more to the sides and close proximity to the building. Is that right? Yeah. And and the reason we chose that was I actually went around and spoke to the different people of Balls, and given that that's only a small area, 
only 30 by 30. We didn't want to place anything in there because, um, you know, the local people spoke about having market days and having having a space where they can have picnics and it's so small, I, I didn't want to interfere with that. Thank you. Nigel. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. I think, you know, the artwork looks absolutely fantastic. The question I have, has Ngāti Apa been included in any of the conversations and input into the design? Um, no, they haven't. Um, Ngāt, I, I was under the understanding that Ngāti Apa took the interior. Is that right, right Clifford? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so Ngāti Whakewahawa were given the opportunity to provide the artwork uh, for the, the the land exterior parts of the complex. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, Councillor Tracy Hira online. Tracy. Um, uh, uh, kia ora kōrua, um, uh, motu mahi, i roto i tēnei, uh, i tēnei uh, mahi he fucker hit hit I just want to um say that it's that that um what's been presented is um, awesome amazing you know, and from my point of view of being able to tell the story of um Ngāti Parawahawaha, um being able to um to bring that's uh, another aspect alive to to the people of uh, bulls and rangi TK. So I just want to mihi out um to, for the work that you've done uh, that you've both done in this area and um the only thing for me is that I still can't, can't couldn't really figure out where exactly they were going to be from that um, from the but you know next time I'm down there somebody will be able to show me that through um, will be able to explain that to me better um, yeah. but I just want to mahi and thank you for the for that mahi because I think that that's uh, we'd be we'd be very lucky to be get, getting that quality of mahi um, and especially the stories that come behind it. Um, and so I just wanted to mahi and thank you. Thank you very much for that, Kilda. Uh, thank you very much. And is there any other questions? One, one, one final one, and I'm mindful of time. Is it, is it the intention of the design and the artist to have um, uh, explanations uh, with regard to the story behind and the, and the meaning and the purpose? Is, is that intended as part of this, this design and plan? Yeah, that, that will also be highlighted next door to or somewhere close to the artwork. Thank you for that. That's a great yeah. idea. Thank you. Uh, Dylan and Clifford, I'll leave it there. We are over time. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for taking the time. I agree the artwork looks absolutely stunning. Um, and is there any closing statements from you? I, uh, I think, Andy, um, where I'm situated and where I'm sitting, and that's alongside the artist, um, we're looking at a sign-off so we can get the engineers and everything pulled together really fast. Um, so I think that's what we're asking for right there. Yes, well, I think Council has agreed in, in principle. So yeah, yeah. Um, I'll have a discussion with the Chief Executive around around sign-off proposals uh, on an operational basis. Kia ora, ngā mahi. Ngā mahi, nui. thank you for your time. Kia ora, thank you for your time. Moving on, councillors, in terms of the confirmation of order of business, we have uh, Horizons presenting to us via Zoom at two o'clock. Otherwise, I will take the as read, but late items, we have... One late item, um, and public excluded. Okay, thank you. We'll deal with that as public excluded. No other changes within this open meeting? Thank you very much. Councillors, I'll move on to <laughs> item number six, the confirmation of the minutes, um, starting page six, looking for alterations and corrections too. And sorry, I'm going off my both my hard copy and my computer from time to time, so I apologise for any changes in numbering. Looking for alterations, corrections, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sorry, do you have one? No, it was just the noise I made. Really. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 10, 10, 11, 
12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, running over to also to the, um, the unconfirmed council meetings. Any alterations and corrections on those as well? And I'll take them as a block. No. Would somebody then like to so move? Yeah. Be recorded. Thank I'll you, Councillor yeah. Belsham, <coughs> Councillor Wilson. Those in favour? Oh. Those against? Carried. Thank you very much. Moving to item seven, this is the follow up actions from the previous meetings. And I'll pass over to Carol or Ash. Carol. Carol. Um, I'm just happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, while we're thinking about that, would somebody like to move the receipt, please? Looking online, Councillor Hiroa, Councillor Gordon, those in favour? Those against? Carried. Thank you. Could you take us through this, please? I'm just I'm happy to take any questions if there's anything arising out of um, what's presented. I'll note that the letter of congratulations to the River Catchment Collective on their work um, has been sent and that Mr Rankin has also received um, a letter of congratulations. It's an action coming out of the 26th of the meeting. Any further questions from councillors? No. no, thank you. I'll move on. Um, item number eight, the mayoral report. <laughs> In light of the warning I've given to councillors and staff about the time frame today, I'll definitely take it as a tabled report. But I will note with that, um, I attended in the, uh, the Martin Christian Welfare AGM on the 27th. And just like to note um, that their income was uh, three hundred and forty-two thousand dollars in gross sales, which gave them an income available for distribution to the community of up to three hundred and seven thousand. They distributed a hundred and eighty odd thousand dollars to the Martin community. Um, that's an awe-inspiring. Um, effort. Other than that, I will take the, some things that I've mentioned that come up in the agenda today, for instance, the three waters. So I'll leave the comments there. But are there any questions around my engagements or my report? No, I'll move that it be received. Looking for a seconder to that. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Duncan. Those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Carried. Thank you. I move through to... Your Worship, you've got the second... Uh, the recommendations out of it. Thank you. In the... There is a... We've moved the receipt of it. There's a second recommendation that Council either agrees or does not agree to be part of the collaborative approach to increase forestry planting throughout New Zealand and advises the Mayor of Tauru District and Wairoa District of our agreement, noting that it would be a funding contribution of $5,000. Um, there is the letter tabled there from Tauru uh, District Council to fellow mayors. To open up the conversation, um, I'll move that this to be considered as a recommendation looking for a seconder to support it, so we've got a conversation. Councillor Dalgetty seconding it. Um, any speakers or questions to this? I'll be happy to speak. Councillor <coughs> Belsham. Yeah, after reading this letter, I mean, we're in a similar situation to these districts where, uh, unfortunately, that's, some of this forestry planting is starting to um, take place on some productive areas of land as well. And it's, it, it is a concern that large corporates are taking the use of available space and utilising parts of our district just to plant in forestry to get carbon credits. I would be hugely concerned if that becomes 
a major part of our district. It, it provides no real income towards our GDP of our district, and um, I'd support the actions of these two districts um, in supporting what they are wanting to do, get a collaborative approach um, feeding back into central government. So you're speaking in favour. Mm. Uh, Angus. No, Councillor Lambert. Oh, Councillor Lambert. Sorry, Richard. Oh, that's right. Yeah, no, just fully endorse what Nigel said. The biggest concern here is under the current system, people can plant forests and just leave them and walk away. And uh, don't you just be left with um, forests of pine trees that are just falling over. And as Nigel pointed out, it's going on to unproductive land. There's a sort of no-term policy for it. Yeah, no, I'm strongly in favour of us endorsing this proposal. <coughs> Councillor Gordon, you wish to speak? Yeah, I, I'd encourage whatever communications we become part of that we're quite objective um, in what we say and what we sign up to. Um, it's very easy to jump on an emotional bandwagon and, and say stuff and be part of stuff that sometimes if you've got an independent person to look at it, they may not necessarily um, agree with everything that's been said or everything that's been written. So I I, I, I'm, I'm happy that we... Um, uh, as a rural provincial council, that we join with other like-minded councils, but we have to make sure that everything we sign up to is objective and easily measured. Thank you. I okay. think it's really enabling us to be part of the conversation. I now have th had three speakers in favour. Are there any speakers against? Um, I won't use the right of reply because everybody has indicated they're speaking in favour. I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Sorry, was that a, a vote against or in favour, Councillor Dalgetty? It was just a time delay. Um, it, it's a, in favour. Okay. I, I'm sorry, um, Your Worship. I'm just I'm wanting to bring up, I just think that the, the wording of the recommendation, which I seconded, um, could cause some confusion because it's to be part of the coll collaborative approach to increase forestry planting throughout New Zealand. And I just wondered if that was clear enough. I, don't uh, I take, take your point. Uh, it has been mm. voted on. <laughs> um, Councillors, do you have do councillors have a concern around the interpretation of the words? <coughs> Your Worship, that we're in a recorded meeting. Sorry for my point. So I think we've clarified ourselves with regards to the statement and the discussions that have been had from from councillors with regards to the intent of that motion. Yeah. Would be oh. just... yeah. I, I think we've we've got the intent there, um, and we will take that intent back to. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I needed to do on my chief executive, my mayor's report. Oh, sorry, I nearly jumped ships there. Moving on to the chief executive's report. Uh, nine. Uh, this is nine point one. I'll pass to the chief executive. Thank you, Worship. I'll go um, point by point and pause to see if there are uh, any elected members wish to discuss. Can we just receive this report as recommendation one, please? Somebody moving. Councillor Duncan moving. Councillor Carter seconding. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. Thank you. We've received it. Go for it. Uh, the health and safety dashboard is appended in attachment one. Uh, secondly, you asked for... Um, staff movements and so we've we'll included those in there for August. Yeah, please councillors if you have issues that you wish raised as we're going through we'll do it sequentially. No issues so far? Thank you, Your Worship. Okay. Attachment two is the engagement and consultation schedule for your awareness. Point four is around the um, establishment of our um, council's compliance officer. Um, I, I wish to include that so you're aware of some of the activities that, that Ashley's up to. Um, I believe she's been very successful in, in what she's doing so far, COVID permitting, of course. 
but uh, I expect that that would be um, a helpful reminder for, to you for the activities that she's undertaking mm -hmm. in our district. No, push on, please. Sorry. Uh, update on Thai Heavy Tennis, point five, as read. Any questions about the update on, ten on the tennis? <coughs> no. Uh, point on. six is an update on Council Mark. I'll take that as read. Point seven is the Audit New Zealand fee proposal, and there is a subsequent recommendation. Um, that uh, proposal and the finalised audit plan is an attachment. Um, and we should, would you like to move to the recommendation now, Your Worship? Uh, yes, I would. I'm um, just looking for the wording on it. Um, so this wasn't, sorry, sorry, Your Worship, this wasn't included as a recommendation, but did require yeah. to be one. Yeah. Um, so we've got some proposed wording on the screen. That you... So this would be recommendation nine, but that the council approve his worship the mayor to sign the audit New Zealand letter relating to the proposed audit fees for 30th of June 2021 and 30th of June 2022. Um, in terms of this, um, there has been a discussion that you have had with the auditors over this, and the explanation is um, part and parcel of this report yes. as to why their cost increases. 7.2 yes. That's my question. Yes, please. Councillor Ash, was it? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, you may have just touched on it just then. That was my question as well. There seems to be quite a significant uh, increase each year. And um, I was just wondering if that has been questioned and if we're comfortable with those fee increases. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I yeah. find the money that we pay out for audit um, to be... Oh, I right, I've got the daughters up home doing my bathroom. <laughs> Whose bathroom's being done? <laughs> Coral, can you please go on mute? <laughs> Thank Sorry. you. Councillor Belsham, Chair of Finance. Um, I'm happy to move the recommendation uh, that we delegate the worship the mayor to sign the order, order New Zealand letter. Looking for a seconder to that. I'll, I'll, I'll second it, Your Worship. Um, Thank you. You just beat Councillor Wilson. You just beat Councillor Carter by a smidgen. Any further discussion around this? One, one quick question for me, if I may, Your Worship. Do we look at alternative sourcing for this? Question and to the Chief, uh, Chief to Executive. I mean, is Chief it, Executive. Is it when we, we've got this fee increase, is it is it the only sheriff in town? Yeah, pretty much. That's a short answer. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. I suspected as much. Yeah. Are you offering? <laughs> right, I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Right. Those against? Carried. Thank you. Point eight, uh, Carol, can you lead this one regarding the... Uh, um, I th hopefully it's self-explanatory. It was provided by Nadia, and Gaylene will be online if there's okay. anything extra um, required. But I think it's around um, a discussion we had at finance this morning and the market day and harvest fair making sure there was funding for that to go ahead this year and so um, Nadia and the team are applying to the pub charity for some funding for this and also using the previous money that was allocated to Project Martin for this event. Um, do they wish to speak online? The You've got them on tap. Do they are they wanting to speak to this? Um, no, no, Your Worship. This is just for information. Okay. Uh, if elected members wish to discuss further, Councillor Ash. Councillor Ash. Uh, just firstly, just um, clarifying that there's or questioning that there's no conflict here. Um, obviously having previously worked for Project Martin, so just wanting to get some clarification there that you're happy with that. I just have a question about um, the wording there, the 50% to 100% of funding allocated um, to the MOU. Are we talking event funding, i.e. the 5,000 per event? Is that, I was just wanting some confirmation no, in regards uh, to that. Firstly, I don't regard that you've got a conflict, Councillor Ash, um, my understanding would be 50 to 100 percent 
of the total MOU funding made available to Project Martin, is the way that I read it. Uh, That's the, how I read it, but I didn't think that that was quite right, given the MOU partners get 5,000 per event. So just, yeah, wanting, wanting clarity on that, please. Just wonder if Gaylene's got any extra information. Gaylene's coming on now. Yes, um, yes, I, I agree with his worship and that it was 50 to 100% of the Memorandum of Understanding funding. A uh, question from me, uh, Ms Prince, are you happy with that? Yes. Okay, I move on. Um. Happy to move on. Thank you. Nobody else has a, has a oh, question. Councillor yeah. uh, Gordon, you've got a question. Yes, I do. So, does that mean that any other events that Project Martin would have undertaken, if it had been in place, are no longer going to be undertaken by council staff? Um, does staff want to reply to that? Okay. The staff were considering the key events that Project Martin had been running. Um, we were there's a possibility another group may form, and that has been monitored at the moment. Um, there's no, we don't have any other groups who have put their hands up to take on these roles. Supplementary question, Councillor Gordon. Yeah. My my question was really framed around the fact that if you're going to spend all of the allocation that was previously given on one of the projects, does that mean that the other projects effectively are not going to go ahead? That, that would be correct. Okay. Yeah. That raise any subsequent questions from councillors? Uh, only possibly for me, if I, through you, Your Worship, that the fact is that um, Council has come forward and said that and with the demise of Project Martin until such time as an alternative organisation can, can stand up to take these things, which we would, would be done with our support. As the Council has indicated that it would take on these projects and therefore there is a cost to Council to do that, not only in cost of the funding, but it is time and cost and labour and, and other staff times associated with it. So I think it is highly appropriate that the cost funding to get those sources, um, uh, those, those events done externally by an MOU is appropriate that they are used internally by council to do that until such time as an organisation um, comes to do it. And, and I, hopefully we can we can do everything that Project Martin did. So. Uh, um, in light of this, um, Councillor Ash, my understanding is often the case where the MOU partners will apply as part of the MOU, as part of the MOU application to apply to one event. And there may well be the opportunity, for instance, we obviously have Market Day and we have Harvest Festival, for example, that there could be an application to events funding as well, as is the, as is the case in other districts, other parts of the district, sorry. Councillor Duncan. Uh, yes, um, just on what Councillor Wilson just said, uh, until such time as, there was another group, it says in here on page, 41 for the next 12 months while a new group is established. Um, is that from this date? Uh, I would suggest that in fact that should be a year from the date of disbandment rather than just um, from now I, because I do see this as being a significant cost and time and effort for our staff. So I'm just asking is that, is, does this mean for the next 12 months while a new group is established? Does it mean until such time as Councillor Wilson said, or could I request that in fact it would be fair to say from a year, a year from disbandment, which would cover one year's worth of events? I guess, councillors, would you be happy if an action that came out of this meeting was that there was a report that came back to council clarifying this whole uh, situation of what events would would potentially run, where council's responsibility lies, etc. Uh, councillors, would you be okay with that as a, an action coming out? Thank you. Do you wish to have a motion recording that? 
Uh, to the Chief Executive. Uh, no, we can just take it as an undertaking, Your Worship. I just want to make sure that we have this worded correctly. Thank you. Here's a report for the October Council meeting regarding Project Martin. What do you want to finish your wishes? And community projects in Martin that they've been responsible for. Thank you. A push on, please. Uh, point nine is regarding the uh, the attachment you would see regarding the request from the Huntable Sport and Recreation Trust. Um, some analysis will be needed on that. We'll report back to Council for the October meeting. Um, there'll be a number. I suspect there'll be a number of questions around that. I'll go Councillor Dalgetty, Councillor Ash, Councillor Dalgetty first. I'd just like to um, declare a conflict of interest. I'm the chair of the Sport, Hannibal Sport and Recreation Trust. Thank you. Uh, if it comes to a vote, then we'll um, exclude you. Mm -hmm. But are you, ha you may well be called on to provide, um, in yes. effect, expert evidence to us. Mm -hmm. but I, I note the conflict and the records will show it. Councillor Ash. Yeah, just a quick question. I absolutely love what, um, what they're proposing to do. I think it's fantastic. So if we were to take this on, is there an opportunity for us to actually um, apply for external funding? And is there an opportunity? Would it be, um, I might have just asked my own question, is, would it be considered double dipping if we were to be applying to, say, Duddings um, to help funded or or obviously with Miss Duddings, but similar sort of things. What are our opportunities for external funding to ensure that this work goes ahead? Um, yeah, no, I'll go to you first. Uh, I, I think this is a request from a trust to council. If there are other opportunities, my I would anticipate that the trust would go to those other, um, directly to those other um, sources of potential funding. The, the question that I'd have of you, Councillor Dalgetty, is um, one of timing. So if we referred this to an October meeting, does that mean that work that you currently have planned and possibly time-framed, does that mean that there'd be a duplication of costs or a swim season impacted by waiting to a decision until October? Can you give me some advice around that, please? Yes, I, I believe it, it would. Uh, um, we would normally be starting in um, pro probably mid-December due to the, the delay in the build at the moment, but that's when we would anticipate opening. And so we would hope that, you know, everything's finished by then. You realise that the request would be uh, a request for unbudgeted expenditure of, of $120,000. Yes, I, I appreciate that. Uh, this is capital works. Not a lot has been spent on this pool in my lifetime. And suddenly we're trying to do two significant projects, rebuild the changing rooms plus renovate an 88 year old pool and all the pipes and, and, and confirm that all the pipes and everything under the concrete which we can't see are okay so that, so there are we're basing our estimates on last year we did a third of the pool for around that 54,000. And there's just significant benefits in having the contra the concrete truck there at one stage, uh, being able to um, concrete for, do all the concreting for both both projects. Plus, the other advantage is we don't have to empty and refill the pool each time, which costs about two and a half thousand. 
So, so the alternative is we just um, uh, we we piecemeal approach, do as much as we can each year. How, however, we pretty much have um, gone to the local trust and raised raised one hundred and seventy three thousand, and we're running out of trust to apply to because if they've already put portions towards this pro these projects. Is that a question, Councillor Duncan? Sorry, Councillor Gordon. I just saw your hand going up. Councillors, can you give me any intent here? Otherwise, we will let it sit until October. Um, Councillor Belsham. So looking at the report, uh, there's a couple of options there that which proposes could be delayed a season, about $50,000 worth of work, so, and that's blasting and resurfacing the, the large end learner's pool. So in actual effect, you've got about seventy odd thousand dollars worth of work that needs to be done in conjunction with the concrete work. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So at at the lowest sort of value, seventy thousand dollars would get the concrete and building work underway to get that part of the project basically seen through. Would that be correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, Councillor Ash, Councillor Duncan, Councillor Ash. Thank you. Um, so further to that, just wanting to know that we will seek other funding. So I'm just very cognizant of the fact that this is unbudgeted. Again, we're asking our ratepayers to fork out for, for something over and above what we're already asking. Um, and if there's if we can't get external funding, is there something that we can miss out on somewhere else, you know, um, rather than going for unbudgeting fund, funds, um, can we, and is there appetite for dumping something else to take this on? Uh, there is a comment on the report around this, I believe. No, no, sorry, Your Worship. Um, the question from um, Councillor Ash, this is exactly why I want to prepare a report mm. to mm. the members. Mm. Uh, um, I don't have a recommendation from this point, it's just for noting. Mm. This would need to come out of a swimming pool budget somewhere for it to be budgeted, wouldn't it? Well, um, yes, I mean, you'd need to also consider that the trusts own the pool of mm. Council. Um, and so there are many other factors that we would like to bring to your attention for you before you can make a decision. Right. Councillor Dalgetty, I think um, it looks as though the recommendation will be that, that this comes back in October. <coughs> um, does that mean that you will or won't start work that you are currently have funds to do? What, will be your position? <clears throat> uh, well, we will, uh, we, we have demoed the changing room, so in the, we will be continuing that. And um, we, we still have applications um, to, uh, to two other outside trusts, um, and we can keep our fingers and toes crossed there. We can go out to the public and explain our situation, yeah, and see if we can raise further, any further funds here. I just ask the, the finance team, the chief executive around, you know, with this sort of thing, is there a possibility of us effectively loan funding or um, doing something like that and then considering in an annual plan later as to whether we had the um, direction to to write off loans? So the short answer is well, we got a sufficient headroom and had that um, capability that we could that fund lots of things at the moment. So uh, as in um, mechanically, can we, yes, uh, get that funding for this? Um, it then becomes philosophical. Is it mm. the thing you, you want to do? 
Mm. Um, <coughs> any suggested way forward from the Chief Executive? Just leave it to uh, I, I just think um, we haven't had the time to do it. <laughs> there are very yeah. many priorities, Your Worship, that we're working on. Yeah. And I'm sorry we haven't been able to prepare a report for you for this meeting, but it's just physically impossible. Yeah, okay, I accept that. Uh, Councillor Herrera, you had a question? Well, just to say that um, that I'd be want it, wouldn't be comfortable to, to move anything personally. I'd want us to, because of the the amount of money that we're looking at and the potential of it not being unbudgeted, I, I'd be prefer that we wait until we get all the information. Not to say that we won't do it, but let's just wait and then we know what we're looking at. Okay. That's a yeah, Could part of the report um, provide the option around loan funding to the trust as an option? Um, just. Uh, so we're looking at all scenarios. Yeah, that's something that could be favourable. All right. So it just becomes an act, <laughs> it just becomes an action. Um, the undertaking that Mr. Prince prepares a report. Mm -hmm. Previous one. Yeah, but it's a it's a mirrors that in effect, doesn't it? It's her department. Yeah. He's noted that. Thank you, Councillor Gordon. Um, look, as part of the report that comes back to us next month, I wonder could the Chief Executive include advice as to whether using our in-house project management capability might be um, a good idea to help these people out, seeing as it's a council asset that they are operating on. All right, thank you. We'll take that as read. Um, we'll carry on, please. Excuse me, Your Worship. We've actually got Horizons here now. Um, Michael McCartney and Craig Nash are online. Yeah, I'll take it now. Just that the next ones might take a bit of time. <coughs> yeah, grant, granted. Thank you. So we'll now move to take a report from Horizons uh, Chief Executive Michael McCartney and um, Nick Pete. And Craig Nash is now going to be part of it. Okay, and Craig Nash. Welcome, gentlemen. Can you hear us? Garantato. Yes, we can. Can you hear us? I'll just zoom in so you can see us. We're a little, oh, here we go. We're a little bit small. So, so um, apologies, you get to see us a bit more close up. <laughs> further, further away. Um, so, um, look, um, to just kick into it, Your Worship. Thank you very much. So, you're going to take us through a position around update around Accelerate 25? Yes. So, um, so first of all, uh, Kia Koto, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you, um, and although be in a virtual context, around Accelerate 25. So, Craig Nash is with me today. So, Craig and I have been doing a series of presentations prior to COVID-2 uh, around the TAs um, and just updating councils on where uh, Accelerate 25 is currently at and where it's headed. Um, and I'll do I'll pass over to Craig to do most of the, uh, the talking, but I'll provide a bit of context at the beginning around history to Accelerate 25 because it's useful to go back in time uh, briefly to talk about where this came from and the origins of the work um, led out by regional chiefs. So I'll attempt to um, share a screen and um, post disabled participant sharing screen. We're just setting up so you can do that. So if you bear with us for 20 seconds. We'll do that. <laughs> right, if you try again now, Michael, you should be fine. Awesome. Right, can everyone see that? Thank you, yes. Okay, so um, as I said, I'll we'll, we'll pass over to Craig shortly. Just, just by way of introduction, though, um, Accelerate 25 originated back in around 2015. Um, and for those around that time, you may recall there was a, a, a by-election in, in Northland that surprised the government a little bit around the impact of regions um, and the role of regions in terms of the political dimensions so with that, there was a renewed interest in government investing in regional economic development. And what they did was identify a number of worthy regions, uh, they called them surge regions, where they would support some analysis on where could growth occur, what were the strengths and weaknesses of the region, uh, and how they could support us on a journey of uh, prosperity. 
Unfortunately for us as a region at that time, we were sort of bottom of class, really, um, near bottom of class in terms of economic performance um, for a number of reasons. Um, and us, along with Northland, um, Gisborne uh, and Bay of Plenty were regions chosen for an economic study. And that study was led out by the then national government. Um, Stephen Joyce was a strong um, advocate and fronted a fair bit of it at the time. Uh, and that study was funded out of government. And Craig, who's with me today, was a co-author of that study alongside Henley Hutchings uh, back in 2015. Um, the study was launched that identified roughly um, nine areas of potential um, opportunity for us. And no surprise to you and Rangatake, primary sector um, was, a, was a feature quite highly. Um, sheep and beef farming in particular was, a, was one of those areas that we needed to focus on, along with other things like distribution, logistics, et cetera. So um, that work then led into uh, an action plan. And the action plan essentially was the catalyst for the term Accelerate 25. And they were the things that we, uh, as a region, wanted to lend our shoulder to, to achieve uh, better economic performance and indeed greater well-being. So with that in mind, um, 2016 action plan was put in place. Uh, and then prior to COVID-1, uh, the lead team, and Craig will talk briefly about um, the construct around how this is led out, then decided with the support of the regional chiefs, the uh, mayors and chair, to do a refresh of the um, action plan. So with that, I'll pass over to Craig, who will give you the more um, granular um, commentary on, on where we're at today and uh, what is now landing in terms of go forward for 820. Thank you, Michael. Uh, kill, kill to everybody. And uh, hi there to all the familiar faces there in Rangatike. Um, and for those of you who I haven't met, um, we will uh, we'll get to know each other really shortly. The uh, slides I'm going to go through is a bit of an explanation of Accelerate 25 for those of you who haven't experienced or understood that uh, in the depth that we have. And also going to take you through the pathway for the refresh, which including um, a real good look at Accelerate 25 and the decision to go forward and then how we're trying to frame ourselves into the future. So um, our first slide, this one really just gives an overview of the environment that we have or how we get ourselves organised. The sponsors for Accelerate 25 are the regional chiefs. So those chiefs are made up of the CEs and the mayors of the eight councils within our region, the seven territorial councils and, and the regional council and chair. Um, they really have the mandate to say, yes, we'll do this or no, we won't. And then we have the whole thing governed by the lead team uh, made up of mayors and chairs, central government, EWI business leaders, uh, that lead team is uh, facilitated by Michael, and uh, it really does pull together a wide um, tranche across the region. Pro uh, program directors is really um, in, the, in the orange box, is made up of myself and really Nick Pete on a part time basis. Um, we are quite low in resource for what we put into this, and uh, you'll understand why that is as we move our way through it. But our job really is to create an environment for the project teams, that's the big green um, bubble in the middle, to be able to work their magic. And these project teams are made up with those most vested in that particular area, including business people, iwi, um, EDAs, and uh, various government um, people as well. Communications backs it and the agencies work to support it. But if we look at it like this, it really is the project teams are the key things that we believe if we can create an environment where teams have the confidence to come together um, to put the effort in themselves, a lot of it's quite voluntary, then they make a real difference for the region and the region supports them to do it. So now further on to the refresh, we look forward from 2015 to up to 20. So what, what really changed? Um, there's some key things out of it was the uh, national growth inc really increased the regional confidence and purpose. There was no doubt about that. The region started to do grow well again, and certainly the work that was um, started by the national government and then continued on by the new Labour uh, coalition government, Labour-led coalition government, was, um, was really focused around the region. So it was very good. And government became more active with the regions with a clear plan. And I think that's, that's really where we came into it. We started this whole process, it's really interesting to understand, when we first started talking with Stephen Joyce, we were 
a kind of an unknown region, be Manawatu Wamanui. And he was, um, we first went down because we figured out there was some money left in a budget. So we had a good old capitalist <laughs> view to go to Wellington. But what we learned in, the, in there was that we were quite um, anonymous also in Wellington. And a lot of the other regions, especially South and Otago, some of those large South Island ones and the more powerful North, North Island ones were continually lobbying in the face and getting a lot of, of effort. Whereas we've always had a, a region that in its own way has been kind of okay. We've had a really good agricultural base, um, a lot of solid um, second, third generation businesses, quite a bit of old money. Um, we have had areas of deprivation, which have grown as Michael talked about, but we've never really come together as one to work as one. And part of the reason too, is I think if you look at our region, um, which stretches way out past Taimanui, down to uh, just north of Otaki, and then over to the eastern seaboard of, of uh, Tararua and Southern Hawke's Bay, and then the, uh, the western seaboard as well. We really are diverse. We're the third largest region in New Zealand with land area. And uh, we sort of figured that we were a little bit like Central District's cricket. And that's the district you get when um, all the other pieces don't sort of naturally form into one. You sort of have a miscellaneous one that all comes together. And that's kind of how our Manawatu Wanganui region was. And, and we acted that way for many years because we didn't really have a lot to do with each other apart from probably competing. So this was, a, this was a big change. One of the first steps we had to do was convince our region to come together and work as one. And the definitions of that was to say, together we can achieve a whole lot more. And if we do, we all share in the success. And I remember that particular meeting we had, and Andy, you would have been there. It was put forward and with a bit of bullying from the chair, I think it was John O'Neill at the time. Um, the region suddenly saw, if we do this, we can share and we will work together. We then were granted the, um, the economic study that Michael talked about, and we were 16th on the list out of 16 provinces or regions, and we went up to number three to have ours done. So it really worked. And a big thing about our, our, our outcome was to actually not so much solve any major problems that our region had, uh, such as the East Coast, Northland. They had a number of um, isolation issues and, and almost uh, dysfunction issues. But ours had a lot of potential that we could unlock. So our commitment was to unlock potential versus solve a major problem. It was a little bit different for government. So over, the, over this period, um, we served to do it. Our, our gross study at the time identified nine different opportunities and four enablers. We worked diligently and hard through those. We built up teams of people and then tapped into the various government resources for funding and policy alignment and introductions but mostly it was actually done from within the region and it worked really, really well. We went from um, a region that was disjointed and ignored um, to one of the regions that government have actually held out to say, this is a way that regions can work together. And it's an absolute credit to the councils who put aside all of the competitiveness and came together to work as one. So, um, and, we've, and because of that, we've accelerated our momentum and we really have um, beaten the numbers over those last five years. So in the middle of this process as well, we were charging along um, with our refresh and, and we, we were about three months into it and this thing called COVID came along and landed on our, on our laps. So the um, energies of Accelerate 25 went into the regional recovery plan as many who were involved with as well. One of the outputs from that was this graph that we pulled together to say what are the things that are going to help us pull ourselves out of a potential big downturn. The really comforting thing was, was that these, are, these particular projects are the ones that we've already identified and we're strongly within the Accelerate 25 framework. And uh, it, it's, you'll see the axis about the impact and the, the sort of size of them. But up in that top right-hand uh, corner, they were the really big dollars uh, needed and the largest impact ones along the way. So a lot of those are around the infrastructure ones. There's the Ruapai Tourism, which of course has a good integration with the Lagatiko district. The Te Aotuanga Highway, uh, connecting Manawatu and Tararua. And the Martin Rail Hub, um, which is one that's very important to yourselves, but also features strongly in one of the priority areas. So now moving on to um, the refresh. 
Henley Hutchins, who have become um, a really trusted partner for the region in helping us to work through things, um, it, it, it conducted our refresh for us. And the first thing they did was go out to everybody and, and get some feedback on what was going on. So um, the first lot was with stakeholders, and this was to a, a wide group of around 200 odd stakeholders. And the, the upshots of that were three quarters of everybody thought we were really moving forward as a region. Um, and that we could be more. They saw some leadership, regional leadership, as opposed to simply council um, leadership. So there was a sense of it coming together and there was a, a request for more. They liked us having a plan. They liked us having focus and understanding the capability. And they actually really liked the success we had in the PGF. We were, we were third in New Zealand and we picked up nearly $220 million out of that fund across our region. So we performed really well and they liked to see it. And, um, and so we went on then to the, to the more refined um, uh, interviews and that was with um, mayors and CEs and those a lot closer time uh, attuned to it. So these were really the stakeholders um, within the middle of it. And uh, this slide here probably says it all, um, was that, that they really liked our sense of combined purpose. And um, they told us that we want to have and hold an ambition for the future. We want to be more joined up, have one common voice to government with no one left behind. And there was a real, a real camaraderie right from the, the larger city councils um, who really wanted to um, help and bring and understand the value of the more agricultural based councils. Um, more collaboration, sticking to our roles, but working together. Um, the importance of EWI to projects and our economic future, which is very naturally said. But this last one says it when we hunt as a pack, we're a lot more successful. And uh, we've had a number of instances where we have come together. Um, the mayors have joined us on um, Pickaways to Wellington in Auckland um, that we've actually taken on board. And it's been incredibly powerful to have everybody working together. Instead of on our own, we're a region of nearly a quarter of a million people. We're in the middle of the middle part of New Zealand. We form a critical part and we really have a voice. And it's certainly um, been a lot better for all us when we do that. Just to note, when we do this off Zoom in a, in a, live, um, a live forecast, everyone laughs at that slide, by the way, so don't hold back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then we go on to um, so how would how would A25 then being a low resource, how do we best um, focus our resources into the future? Um, and we really came down to these two things. Um, that we are an enabling body. So the role of everything we do is to facilitate, encourage all leadership, press parties to invest into the region. And the doing role in a lot of those projects is the organisations of councils, EDAs, business enterprises, et cetera. What we found that understanding those roles, how we play and the best way to play has been a key output from the refresh and we've got some real clarity out of that. We also learned that we really wanted to play to um, the strengths of A25. And some of the key ones around the, um, the relationships and connections both right across the region, we found that under Accelerate 25, it's a place where everybody could come to and have a, have a level of trust and openness. Um, it was kind of a, an independent, neutral place for everybody, which was really helpful. And then we worked really hard on our, uh, our central government connections as well. Been supported well by central government, but given us really great people to work with who have championed our region to all parts of government and provided a really good channel. So that's important. Um, assembling the resources um, have been incredibly important. We, we do quite a lot of uh, building teams, initiating teams, bringing them together, helping get a chairperson set up and then getting the hang out of the way so the team can do their stuff. But we're always there to help out and uh, solve problems as well. Providing a target down the left-hand side also is our big regional vision. And for us to champion that and hold it out there has had a, a much bigger impact and value than we had initially thought. And the one down the bottom was interesting, just building confidence. And if we look at so many of our teams, they work quite hard, but 
trying to get big government money is pretty tough stuff. And there's been quite a few times where our teams have given up, thrown their hands in the air, not knowing how close they were to getting it over the line. And uh, we've played quite a role in understanding that and just inspiring and, and helping to solve a few problems and get things over the line. So that's the, the strengths of Accelerate 25, which goes on to then into the future, how should we intervene or what's the best way that we can work? First one is getting things going. That's the identification of what are these big areas that we should work on? And within those big areas, what's the biggest thing that we could possibly do? So that goes on to two. And then connecting, bringing the right people to the table with a clear vision of what's to be achieved and helping to resource those teams and getting them underway. And then the second part of that is creating and, and continuing momentum by empowering those teams, operate themselves and, and just go like hand with a, knowing they've got the support of us. And then that last point down there is around the stiffening of that resolve when the going gets tough to be a little tougher, get over the line, solve some problems, help get that little bit of extra work and keep that ambition high. So that's been the, the main um, focus areas for the lead team. We now move on to um, particular projects and how do we approach those? And I, I mentioned that just now, it's not really only just understanding what the big areas are, but really going into them to say, if we were to help here, where could we get the most impact and understanding those? And we've used this term called the acceleration zone. So if we understand where we are, where we're trying to get to, so what are the key things that we could work on together? And then rallying everybody to focus on those. So one example of those is in our transport and distribution. So um, we, we, we ongoing work with through our our um, accessing Central New Zealand is our is our committee from a, from um, Accelerate Twenty Five, and uh, that's our key way of actually bringing together. So we have a land transport committee, which is a uh, a um, statutory requirement to really go through a lot of evidence of funding. But accessing Central New Zealand is really a a strategic place where everyone comes together, make sure that all of our investments feed off each other and that every dollar spent in our region is spent wisely. So we get a lot of things over the line. We're at the, we're at the front end when we're banging away for, um, for government money. Uh, the Te Aua Tūlanga Mineral Tū Gorge was a classic one where we achieved so much to create a central hub for our whole region that we're all prosper from. That was a key part that we played, and now we stand aside and make sure those commitments from government are upheld. Um, and then, of course, our other ones in the Martin Rail Hub comes into that as well. So one of the outputs from that particular group, for example, is this map here. Now this is a, um, a digital platform of all the large infrastructure projects to do with transport across the region. And uh, we have got the link for that. We're happy to recirculate that out to all the councillors. And I, I, I encourage you to go in and have a bit of a play. Each of those circles has a, a great range of information behind them, explaining what they are, what they're trying to do. Um, the sort of the size of the money. I think there's around $5 billion worth of investment in there, and they all connect off each other. When we um, went into bat for, particularly for Horofanua, on the O2 and L um, highway, to make sure that we actually got the funding for that, we produced this map and we went to government and said, we are really onto this. Here's how every council works hard in the region. Here's how it's connected. Here's why you should spend money with us because we're going to use it well and we use it um, with a, you know, a bit of diligence around it. So that's just one example from there. As I say, we're happy to, um, to share that out. So on to the future now. Um, here's our, here's our, our refreshed area of priorities. And these are not absolute, by the way, but these are probably a, a summation of the key things we've seen at the moment. We recognise that these are always fluid and a number of things come along that we haven't seen in the past, but we need to be agile enough to bring them up when they are a real flavour. I'll quickly go through these. Firstly, the pillars. Um, or no, I'll start with the bearers, if you like. And if you think about a house, the bearers are the, the foundation. There's no point in building a house unless you've got a strong foundation to build it on. No doubt the effective transport networks are incredibly important. 
to help cement our place as a central dis distribution hub in the middle of New Zealand and everything else around it. High performing workforce has come up more um, and more and was actually adopted as the number one priority for the lead team back in 2017. So we actually commenced a quite a big structure across the region of um, how we do that. And we uh, introduced things called STAGs, which were, um, they were regional workforce teams or committees that really focused on it. And now they come together under a government, um, a government structure called um, regional skills leadership groups, which have gone right across New Zealand, but it was based off the initial work that we had done. So it's quite good to see um, that picked up as well. Um, the high-speed internet connectivity, so critical um, for our rural areas, not only the towns, but um, out into our agricultural areas where technology is playing a much bigger role in raising our productivity. Uh, community infrastructure, and this is a new one for us. Um, how do we collectively look at our housing issues? And really, that's, a, that's something that's come forward from a lot of the mayors saying we're, we're going away on our own trying to bang away against every other town or city to get our peace. But if we go as a region of two and a of quarter of a million people, we simply have a much bigger offering and government have an appetite to talk and work with us as a region. Um, there's quite a focus on energy, uh, particularly around hydrogen and alternative uses of energy, um, of which uh, Lingatike will play a part. And environmental sustainability is really a lens that goes across everything that we do. So that's our foundation on the pillars. Um, sustainable food and fibre, this is a, a massive area and obviously we are a, a, a large farming and food producing region. It includes our food technology um, products and uh, agri-tech capability as well. The new part about this is the introduction of fibre when we did our, um, our first study. Forestry wasn't a part of our original study but it certainly is now. And with Martin being in the middle of 2 million tonnes of timber being harvested every year for the next 18 years, um, it's in a tremendous place to profit from that, and which has seen the birth to of the Martin Rail Hub. And uh, just commend the uh, Rangitiki District Council, particularly Andy and Peter for their leadership in helping to get that underway. Specialised services is a large bucket that a lot of businesses fall into. You'd be familiar with Hedge Road and Wanganui. You have a lot of great um, wholly owned companies that export products all over the world. But we do have from pharmaceuticals to a wide range of others in there. The Māori economy is still an untapped um, area for us. We do have a, um, a Māori uh, economic development program called Te Pei Tafiti, um, And uh, we're looking to re-energise that some more. We have some amazing um, Māori farming operations across uh, across the region. The Ardiho Corporation is one of the largest ones that be familiar to yourselves. But then we are at other stages of iwi, which are still in an early settlement stage. So what we really want to do is find a way to come forward together and work closely with them. And the last one on that was tourism, shape of the long-term view. We started that whole focus on the uh, Tongarero National Park, um, the Luapai District Council and the Wanganui River. But now it's spread more, and I know Rangitike hosts a number of quite niche and, and growing tourism opportunities, as does the rest of the region as well. So what we're seeing, those are the investable sort of pillars. So my voice is getting a little hoarse. Um, look, that's the end of our presentation. Could have to take any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Michael. Uh, questions from councillors? I guess, um, Craig, a lot of this you know, has sort of dropped off the, the profile, if you like, through, the, through COVID in the last two or three years. And so there's a little bit of um, bringing people back up to speed with what has been done and where the future is. So this is a pattern that you're going to take to each council? Yes, we have, as Michael says, we are um, in the last stages now of, of um, informing councils and especially bringing new councillors who haven't seen the XLA25 up to speed. 
we have just, um, th this has completed the refresh. Part of the refresh was to do a new work program and also a, a summary of all this. These have just been posted on our website. So if you go to the Accelerate 25 website, you'll find an example of that. And uh, shortly, we'll be launching a new website and we'll all be notifying you all by letters to direct you to that. So on that is a complete summary of the next three or four years of our work and how we're going to go about it. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Thank you. I just want to say I found this very valuable. We did um, have mention of this when I first came on two years ago in our uh, strategy workshop, I think initially talked about Accelerate 25, and um, it's great to see it refreshed. Uh, I did think that a lot of it was aspirational, so it's great to hear that there is a work plan, and I look forward to seeing the, work, the, the uh, website. Thank you very much. Thank you. Craig, will you also wrap in the stuff that's been done on the um, main trunk railway line, uh, passenger, etc. Uh, the work that, for instance, Mia Ruapehu Don is heavily involved with, and a similar body of work on forestry that Tarua uh, and Wairua have started. Will that fold into this to some extent as well? It, it certainly, um, that's included, the first part of that, Andy, is included in accessing Central New Zealand. Um, that's how it taps into there. So we have the environment where all that's included. Um, and the uh, title of forestry is included in our, in our larger forestry uh, aspirations for the region. So the point on the, on the transportation is quite important. I think, um, Mayor Andy, as you've witnessed, Taking that, um, the image that you saw with the bubbles of various projects to, uh, to government and showing how things are integrated has, has been a powerful tool because often government officials and MPs and ministers look at project by project. So I recall um, uh, on the, 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 the cusp of losing Otiki to North Levin where the mayors went to meet with the minister and put up that picture and showed the connectivity of all the transportation, rail and roading infrastructure planning that we had in place from a spatial point of view, was a very powerful tool uh, and we believe was instrumental in, in um, victory being brought from the tools of um, defeat on Otaki to North of Inn, to the extent now that um, that project's um, hopefully due for completion by 2029. So, um, you know, we have, as Craig said, um, $3 billion worth of roading infrastructure for our region, uh, along with other infrastructure like Wanganui Port over the next five years. So our biggest challenge, to be honest, um, in terms of the space is labour. Skills and talent is our biggest challenge. Um, and uh, that's what we constantly hear from industry is getting talent. And it's a New Zealand, if not a global challenge for us all. So that's probably the main area we'll focus on. Thank you. We are tight for time today. So I'll take questions from Councillor Gordon, Councillor Hero, Councillor Gordon, Angus, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Andy. Um, Michael, just on the transport thing, one, one thing that bugs me is the disjointed nature of previous government spend in, in the central region that we're in. You know, we've got an electrified train set that ends in Palmerston North and it goes through the Hamilton, but it doesn't connect to the south or the east and the west. And we've got similar things with the quality of our roading. You know, you mentioned OT, OT and L. I mean, there's all sorts of examples like that. It'd be really nice if we just had some of them that joined up and had the similar quality of service. Yeah, good observation, Angus. And I think rail is a big focus for us. So there'll be some announcements around rail um, in terms of the Lower North Island Passenger Rail Service. Uh, There's a lot of work working with uh, Greater Wellington. And we are hopeful that we'll end up with New Zealand's um, first hybrid train system, um, battery uh, diesel electric. They will provide multiple services from Palmerston North to Wellington um, in the next few years. So um, that's, that's a, as you can appreciate, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of spend, um, but we're in negotiation with government at the moment. So, and then we look north, Angus, towards connections with Hamilton. There's a whole lot of mayors and the chairs of both Wellington region, uh, Waikato and ours, focused on that rail network to be linked up as well. So, um, yep, yeah, I agree with you on the roading issue. It's a difficult one, but you know, the agencies we're dealing with there can be challenging at times, but we'll keep, keep going. Thank you. And finally, uh, Councillor Hira. Uh, kia ora. Um, I, I just uh, um, a mahi to you both for um, the presentation. 
what I'd like to say about it is that it's a really good example of um, when you when you'd put up the picture of the herd and the lion tasting it, the whole thing of collaboration and how that how um, you know uh, in some instances it can be you can give those sort of presentations into like within a council space, but actually if people if um, for the ratepayers and our our, you know, for people to actually see and and hear and understand the benefits of working together and what that what that can do, um, I think that this uh, presentation is a really good um, example of 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 how that can be um, put out. Because the reality is that we are in a space where collaboration isn't necessarily. Uh, in some areas, not really where people want to go. But I just wanted to mahi to the work that you've done. Thank you. Good. Now, mahi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Craig, for today. Um, we, ne we need to push on. Our agenda is about 10 feet deep, and we're only about a foot into it. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Worship. Thank you, Councillors. Uh... I'll pass back to the Chief Executive to continue Councillors, we will take a break at three, um, but we do need to be fairly um, succinct. Peter. Thank you, Rishka. I'm back onto page 41 and point 10, the statement of service performance. Uh, I might just give a brief report and perhaps ask the chair of the committee to, if there's anything you wish to add, Your Worship. Sure, go ahead. Uh, for me, the statement of service performance um, was a, uh, a disappointing read, but I want to uh, consider that, or the meeting considered that disappointing read with a couple of things. Firstly, um, that the deliverables of the SSP and how that is um, uh, ha has been agreed by council as a, at the start of this LTP process has considerably changed. Uh, this was uh, uh, an SSP that was agreed um, 18 months ago um, there are some items that uh, are physically unable to be achieved. Um, there are some that we'd struggle to achieve. There are some that uh, council staff measured differently in the way in which we uh, calculated our, our measures. Uh, and, and some of them we haven't done well enough. Um, and I think as a summary, that that's, there's a, a number of combining factors. I have a great more confidence by the workshops that we've had with staff about the measures that we have put into this year's SS uh, statement of service performance, how we are going to measure those. Uh, and you may see uh, some, um, or you would have seen at, at the meeting where George presented the a dashboard of how we intend to present that both to you and to uh, the public. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It was fairly sobering reading. I'll, because it came up in finance, I'll pass through to um, Councillor Belsham, Chair of Finance, and next, Councillor Belsham. Thank you, Worship, and thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, the, there was discussion held on this this morning, and it does, at first glance, some of the measures um, certainly show that uh, there's a lot of not achieves in there. and. And when you delve into the background, um, the potential for this council to achieve some of them just was pretty much non-existent. It only took one minute um, failing for it to be a not achieved. So I think that certainly the council through the um, long-term plan process has acknowledged some of the relevance of some of those measurements and the non-relevance of some of those measurements. And a, and a good plan has been put in place about producing some relevant outcomes for the next LTP period. Um, and I think the public can be um, confident that the new reporting process will give a better understanding of how council is performing. Um, yeah, this, this most recent SSP has been, um, yeah, in some areas, hasn't had a huge amount of relevance. And I think um, we all agree with that. Um, so. Moving forward, I think we'll get some better information coming out. Um, but I'd agree there are some areas there that we haven't achieved and that have been of concern and they have been addressed. We're, we're confident that they've been addressed and, um, and that's what these are about. They're about finding areas of opportunities to improve and, um, and, and this new reporting process will continue to do that. So, yeah, um, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Peter, do you wish to talk about the individual 
some feedback that's going to be referred back to council. Uh, oh, that's the next. Yeah. The next, next point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. So the next point, yeah, point eleven, is the <coughs> annual resident survey results um, that was presented to um, to the finance and performance committee. Uh, the committee asked to move a, a, I acknowledge that I will be having a brief conversation about that in full council, uh, and the committee have recommended that we have a brief conversation here, but to move that paper to a future full council meeting um, and have a full discussion at, at a future council meeting. You wish to comment? Oh, but no, other than we've received the report, but there are some areas in there that I think um, require some, some, um, some time spent on, on dealing with some of the issues that have been highlighted, and I think that time needs to be allocated, and, and the agenda today was, was full, so to the next council meeting to actually deal with some of those issues that have been highlighted um, through that report. If I, if I may, Worship, um, you know, I've signalled as Chief Executive to, to you as elected members for some time that I don't believe the annual residence survey is an appropriate method for really gauging um, the satisfaction of our public, uh, or our ratepayers, or sorry, our residents, I should say. Um, and so we've implemented a, um, a point of contact um, service uh, assessment where um, people who have made contact with us in whatever way that might be, be a swimming pool or a service centre, uh, a consent, etc., cetera, are, are invited to give us instantaneous feedback um, an annual resident survey um, this year we had 267 respondents across the whole network. Um, we, uh, we don't even know if some of those people actually live in the district, for example, so it's fraught with challenges, notwithstanding that some of the information there within that document is valid, but I wish for it to be more contemporary in terms of our presentation to you. Um, you may have seen a table document which is uh, the results of uh, just one week's worth of data on our, um, on our service counters, um, where in a week we've had 109 responses. Uh, and of those, um, the index is 94, which means that you'll see from this chart, um, on the 22nd or the 9th, we're 100% dark green. So everyone was very satisfied on that day. Every person was very satisfied. And so this gives us a, an indication of our satisfaction as well as dissatisfaction and free text that people can actually, that we can address straight away. Yeah, however, I'd, I'd hate the process to, to hide some genuine real concerns that people have out there. Obviously, we, we have a number of issues um, that we need to perform better at. Um, you know, um, water condition, um, the way we handle uh, requests for service, all of those sorts of things. So I had a discussion with the Chair of Finance, um, Councillor Belsham. We felt it was absolutely appropriate, even um, in spite of the time frame issues, to be able to report it. It gives us transparency back, and we'll raise those issues um, later. Uh, thank you very much. So that has been referred back to Council, and may well go into workshops and see how we can deal, deal with these issues. Thank you. Do you wish to move? Any questions from councillors at this stage? No, we'll push on. Uh, point 12 has a recommendation, Your Worship. Take it as read regarding the um, a, a letter received from Nga Wariki Natiapa to extend the current rate of mission they have. Uh, and so, uh, recommendation two refers. Look, I'll move from the Chair that we do approve a rates remission to, uh, to Ngāwāraki Ngātiāpa. Um, and I will need to put a time frame around there, won't I? Yes. Of... The request was for three years. Three years? Yeah. Three, oh, three years is fine with me. I'll speak to it if I get a seconder to it. Looking for a seconder to this. Councillor Dalgetty, you're seconding? Thank you. Um, any questions of this report first? Sorry, I just got a question. I'll go Councillor Gordon, then Councillor Belsham, then Councillor Wilson, Councillor Gordon. Yes, Your Worship. My, my question to staff with this request we've had, is there any way of understanding what proportion of the use of that site 
could be judged as commercial um, and effectively captured by Nati Apa for, the, for their own benefit, as opposed to the educational? I'll speak to that as part of my speaking to the motion, if you're okay with that. I'm happy. Councillor Bilsham. Yeah, just a question in regards, to, so in the report, um, item 12.5, the 100% on all rates other than rates for utility services and then 50% on rates for utility services. So is that what we're uh, suggesting in that recommendation? It already had about the th period of three years, but are we applying A and B as listed in the report? Um, I saw it as a continuation of what we are currently doing. So we approved... Um, Perhaps you can enlighten me on exactly what the process was to start with. Uh, well, I'm not sure on the previous agreement, but I would presume that this agreement would take into account those remissions. So 12.5 says council has the ability to grant the following remissions, which is 100% on all rates other than rates for utility services. But then we have a 50% rate um, remission for utility services. Is that what we are? So it's both. So that the um, paper states that you can remit 100% of rates other than utility, but then for utility, you can remit 50%. And that's what they got last time was right. those So this two. is a continuation of the previous one. Yeah. Thank you. That, I just wanted to clarify yeah. that, but yeah, probably in the, if, this, if the recommendation reflects so that. Where that dot, dot, dot was, that was where it was going to go. Yeah. Thank you. You're happy with the explanation? Yes. yes. Councillor Wilson? I'm looking to speak to the motion when you're ready, Your Worship. Any further questions before we start speaking to the motion? Councillor Ash? Yeah, thanks. I think um, Councillor Gordon um, touched on on what I wanted to, to question, uh, re the commercial um, nature of the of the business, um, but also wondering if it's done on a uh, is there some system that uses a pro rata system there that x amount of the property is used for education or um, how how does that actually roll out? Thank you. Um, still just taking questions. Uh, Councillor Duncan, Councillor Hero, Councillor Duncan. Not a question. My question is, um, so the facility is classified as an education facility. So um, so this is, it continues to be classified as an education facility. And if so, um, do we, we have several education facilities in our district. So do they also, are they also um, able to apply for? The, an the answer is yes, they're gazetted as such. And so it's an automatic process. Thank you. Councillor Hira. No, I'm just waiting for the opportunity to support the motion. Right. Okay, we'll get to speakers too. As mover, um, I have quite a, I'm there on site quite often. The, reali the reality is they have a series of commercial operations, such as uh, the dairy farms, such as, um, um, strawberry production, all those sorts of things, they all occur off-site. Mm. The principal use of this facility is to educate um, and some administration, uh, their centre, if you like. However, they also provide education and facilities in terms of our council facilities in terms of training. So the Mahi Tahi program, for instance, that we're involved with, um, runs out of Te Pono Te Araki. Um, so I'll save my rebuttal if I need it, but uh, strongly in favour of this. A huge number of courses and apprenticeships are being taught out of these facilities. Other speakers to the motion? Councillor Wilson. Um, thank you, Worship. So I've got some questions, but as it sits right here, I am going to speak against this motion. Now, I'm basing that on the fact that 
we've previously made decisions around this council table that we really need to look at the costs and some cost savings within council. And one of those cost savings was the level of rate remission that we give to organisations across the board. Yep. And it is a significant amount of money that is funded by other ratepayers. Um, I just question the policy on this one here, where it does say the policy does not apply to organisations operating for private pecuniary profit. Now, I accept your explanation of that. However, I do think we need to look at not only these sorts of arrangements by council, but also these sorts of rates remission policies across the board. And, and I think our whole policy in that respect needs to be reviewed. Also, three years, I read somewhere in here, and I'm struggling to find it, and I apologise, that the application was a yearly application for rate remission, and you've indicated three years. I think, if I may, yes. clarification. In the policy, bottom of section 4.3, it says that there's an annual, they have to submit an annual applicant, an, an, an annual certification, as opposed to it being approved. Can council, whether the council will remind organisations to require, um, that they confirm their eligibility on an annual basis. It isn't quite the same as being approved. Okay. Could somebody ask answer a question in further to to because it's relevant to this? Um, what other educational uh, facilities within the Rangitiki district um, are facilitated with the same? Is this an education thing across the board? So do all schools receive this or? I'm just trying to get my head around this policy and, and what it's actually applied to. I stand to be corrected from staff, but my understanding is that schools are gazetted a, a, as such within our district plan process. <coughs> so they're gazetted as educational facilities. And if they are gazetted in that manner, my understanding would be they, these conditions automatically apply to them. So, for instance, whether it's Taiapi area school or a primary school, um, they are automatically caught up in this. Is it also subsequent, if I may ask, that it also apply to the 50% of the um, services? Uh, that's my understanding. So that is captured by across the board? That's my understanding, but I stand to be corrected and, and have that checked. I can't do it now, but I can certainly confirm that, or otherwise, do it now. Um, my only hesitation would be on when the introduction of the PAN tax came in and how that applies. Did you wish for us to date it as an undertaking? I think, yes, that will be an action that we will need to get clarification on. Uh, you can't just take my yep. understanding of it. So, Councillor Ash. Sorry, did you finish speaking to it? Uh, yes, yes, I, yes, I did. Thank you. Councillor Ash, Councillor Hira, Councillor Ash. Yeah, thank you. Um, my original question wasn't actually answered. I, I did ask whether or not it was applied pro rata across the, um, the, the property or if it was just pertained to the area that was used for education. Um, but I think I'm, I'm not feeling terribly supportive of it insofar as the work that they do is fantastic, but they are a commercial um, operation. Um, and their primary purpose at that location is actually to have their headquarters, not as an educational facility was my understanding of it. Needless to say, they do um, deliver educational uh, programs there, which is fantastic, but I, yeah, I'm, the way it's put at, at, at this stage, I'm not feeling so supportive of it. Thank you. Um, perhaps we, we do have Coral online as a councillor. In terms of Coral, um, you would probably run into a conflict of that working out of that facility, but could you provide us with any ad advice around use? You'll need to unmute. Uh, Kelly, everyone, yes, I, I do need to highlight that, so I put my hand up that a conflict of interest because I work for the Renanga. Um, yes, they they do have a commercial division. The commercial division is um, Ngāti Upper Developments Limited, which is not seated here. The Renanga, um, the, the trust itself, which is 
a different um, altogether. I, I mean, this is what I know. Um, uh, so the education stuff sits here and so does the health service, not for profit. Um, but the um, business arm of the Runanga, the administration, does sit here, but not natal developments, which is our commercial arm, which doesn't sit here. If that can clarify as to some there is, um, and is, um, yeah, none of our commercial businesses sit on site either. In terms of education, um, yeah. So Te Kotuku Hauwara sits on one part, the administration group for the Runanga sits here, and the education, it is an education facility because the Kotuku Hauwara does do education services as well. If I can explain it like that, it's about all I can offer, guys. Thank you, Thank you. Councillor Hedera. Okay, well, um, in our, I'm sure we've all read our rates for mission policy um, 2020, and if you haven't, it's on, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a space in there, 4.2, that clarifies what and who fits into this, which I'm reading it as that they would fit, um, that this facility would fit clearly into it. But at the end of the, um, so it talks about um, the purpose of the organisation that were about recreation, cultural, health, education or instruction for the benefit of all the residents or any group or groups of residents of the district. So um, I totally support this kaupapa, whether it's 100% or 50%, because as far as I understand, there would be nowhere in this um, in our region that, um, that we can say there'll be nowhere in the rangitike that, uh, of an organisation that sits squarely in all of it. They not only provide cultural that anyone can access, they provide health, they provide, um, what are the other things that we're saying as part of our, our, our criteria? Uh, so we're saying recreation, cultural, health, education, or instruction of the benefit for all the residents. So that clearly says in our own policy what fits into it. And so that's why I'm supporting it, whether it's 100 or 50 or gets voted down, that's my cope up as why it makes sense to me why, why why I would be putting my hand up to be a seconder of the motion. Kelda. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Dalgetty. Um, I'm supportive of this rates remission, basically um, endorsed by the previous presentation around the accelerated 25, um, the Murray economy, um, it needs to be encouraged in our region and schools and training are what's holding us back. So I agree with what Councillor Harrell mentioned. Yep. Um, I have had advice once I found my phone <laughs> that schools are not rateable under the Education Act. The Rating Act. Sorry? The Rating Act. Under the Rating Act, sorry. Which is what I was really referring to under the gazetting process. Any further speakers? Can I just seek some clarity? If you've, if you've sorted that from the Education Act, Your Worship, I may, the schools receive 50% on rates and services and water? No. They do? I think so, yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but that's something that would staff would need to do. But effectively, by adopting this, we'd be treating them as a school. What I'm looking to clarify. Thank you. Um, but do you still wish this? Uh, I'm just picking on. Oh, just <laughs> so, so my understanding is, if we are going to pass this, we'd be treating uh, this facility exactly the same as we'd be treating a school. Is that? everybody else's understanding in terms of staff. Brian Poynton is actually online. He's the one giving us advice about the... Does he wish to speak and clarify this? He will be on here, so... Angus, have you got a question? <laughs> Councillor Dalgetty? Um... We just need to clarify around the annual versus three yearly um, application. Well, I believe it needs to be annual. 
you'd need, if you're going to do that, my motion was for three years, you'd need to seek an amendment. Are you wishing to move an amendment to one year? Yes, that's correct. Is there a seconder to that? Yes. You have a seconder. Um, do you need to take time to explain your thinking or are you happy for it to go straight to a vote? Happy for it to go to a vote. Right. We're seeking um, <coughs> a vote around the amendment that the motion gets amended to change three years to one year. Those, those in favour, please raise your hands. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have a majority. The amendment is carried. So this would be then deemed to be, in effect, an annual process they would need to go through. You, you would need to go through. Yes. Mm. So um, the substantive motion now reads that the council would re approve the rate remission in this respect of their property, etc., uh, for a period of one year. Councillors, um, are you comfortable if I put this to a vote? He's got a series of nods around the room. Um, right of reply. Look, I think effectively my right of reply, reply has been put really well by Councillor Hira. So they're not only an education facility, a cultural facility, um, but the amount of work they do in the health area, um, this is where most of our COVID vaccinations were done through. Um, it, it's a, an incredible response, and they they view the social areas of this incredibly highly. Uh, we have a number of apprentices that have been um, taken on as a result of work that is being done out of the training. So, I'll, having had the right of reply, I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven. We have a majority. Thank you, carried. Move on, please. Um, Your Worship. Yes. Um, before we move off this item, could we possibly signal to Nasi Apa that in, if they put in an application next year, that they should really be quite explicit around the percentage of any commercial activity that is undertaken on the site? I think if they were, that would clarify any doubts that people would have and it would probably be easier for us and e actually easier for them. The community may well do that more favourably. Thank you very much. Um, we can just take that as a, something that staff will discuss with um, at our operational level. Um, before we move on to point 13, Your Worship, is the undertaking, Mr. Toombs, to clarify blah, 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 from Councillor Wilson, is that still required? Um, it would have come up as part of that discussion, I think we're fine. Yeah, but actually, I believe that's been answered. So, yeah, thank you for that. I was just reading right, it. Thank you. Uh, another point now for uh, <coughs> the resolution is on here of heights, road names, point 13 on page 42. Um, we've had two proposals. You'll see in point 13 one that the authority for this sits in this committee. Um, recommendation three refers with a picture of what the writing looks like it's on page 94. Look, I'll happy, I'm happy to move from the chair that subject to comment from the Mark Community Committee that we approve the names of Rainer Lane. Uh, for the larger cul-de-sac and Kiriru Court for the smaller cul-de-sac. I'll second that. Yeah. We have a second. Yeah. Um, is there anybody with the wish to speak strongly against this? Councillor Ash. Sorry, that sounds so wrong. I'm not speaking against it. I was. I just had a question. Mm -hmm. 
if that's okay. De definitely not speaking against it at all. I was just wondering, do we have a list of of um, names that we can actually tap into of notable um, families, notable people in our community, past, present? Um, no. No, I don't think we do. Because it would be great to have a plan of we've got all these subdivisions happening and it'd be great to have an opportunity to celebrate some of our awesome people. Yeah. Um, if I can just answer that, we I've asked George to bring forward the road naming policy, um, which needs to be reviewed and presented to council. And as part of that, there will be discussion around some appropriate names um, and also including iwi and as part of that. So you'll see that soon. Thank you, I firmly believe. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I firmly believe that for a developer to do the amount of work that they, they do, they should have some say in, in the naming of the roads associated with it. However, I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. Uh, it's now three o'clock. Um, we'll break for how long do you need, councillors? Um, Ten minutes. Ten minutes. So we'll resume at 3.10. Thank you very much.
Find people, please. Let's. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Listen, um, I have, I do have some concerns around where we're at in the agenda paper. We're probably 15% of the way through the agenda. Uh, we've now been going for a couple of hours. And I will look to close council off uh, no later than 5.30. Uh, what happens is you get to a state of not being able to make good governance decisions um, once you've been at the table all day. So that's the sort of time frame that I'm looking to work towards. Carry on with the report, please. The Chief Executive. Thank you, Worship. Next point, point 14, page 42, regarding Kiwi Road and Fly Happy uh, and the proposed road stopping. I've got Graham Poynton online. Graham, can you join us, please? And start your video. Online. Good, you good afternoon. I'm not sure I can be seen. <laughs> That's okay. Yes, good thing. Can you please introduce the concept for Kiwi Rose? Sorry, I'm just getting. Ah, here we go. Some help from uh, Jess. Thank you, Jess. Uh, you want me to run through this? Yeah, Graham, we, sorry, Mr. Poynton, we need to be um, fairly sharp around this. Um, have you any relevant matters that are, are not tabled within your report? Anything That's you'd like question. to highlight? No, I'm, I'm happy that it's all within the report. Okay, so recommendations, uh, point five or three, uh, Any questions of the report to Mr. Poynton? Um, there is a, a map that um, is referred on page 95. Yeah. Okay, is somebody would like to move a motion to the effect? Happy to move, Your Worship, especially if our videos get turned back on. <laughs> Thank you. Right, who was that moving? Councillor it was Councillor Gordon. Councillor Gordon and Councillor Duncan, are you wishing to second? Right, Councillor Gordon, do you wish to speak to the motion? Uh, no, you, well, Brief, briefly, Your Worship, I'm familiar with the site. Um, the report is a good report. I think we should just get on with it. Um, it's going to be productive for everybody. Ticks all the boxes. Any, any further speakers to the motion? Well, because no one's spoken against you, I'll remove your right of reply and I'll put it straight to a vote. Those in favour? No. Those against? Motion is carried. Um, we should, I presume that was recommendation four? Yes. Uh, so proves now you're okay for me to sell for that amount, etc. Yeah. Um, would you wish to vote on that? We did. Uh, do you, no, I don't believe you did it as a block. All right. Sorry. Okay. Well, I'm happy to move recommendation five. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Second. All right, we've got a mover and a seconder for recommendation five. I was trying to treat them as a block. I quite correctly was stopped. Those in favour? All right. Those against? Carried. Thank you. Point six of uh, 15, the Martin Civic Centre. Um, take it as read. Really is an update on where we're at with that. Um, and I have three recommendations there. Um, firstly, to, to note that we are using the Better Business Case methodology. Uh, the second that I do uh, ask for two elected members correction, um, two of the committee chairs um, to, to, to join um, some of the work that we're doing in that better business case. And finally, I just wanted to reconfirm in recommendation eight that Martin and Ty Happy are, are sequenced as per our um, council's direction outlined in the long term plan. Okay, we'll take this separately. Uh, recommendation six. Um, would somebody like to move recommendation six 
it's really just noting the better business case will be used. Would somebody like to move that? Happy to move. Councillor Belsham moving, Councillor Hero seconding. Any questions? Does anybody wish to speak to it? No, that's I'll put it's, it straight it's... to the vote. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. I didn't see any. No. Recommendation seven. This is the chair confirms that the chair of audit and risk committee and or finance and performance and or assets and infrastructure committee delete one. So one of those would be deleted. Um, um, I'll move that that the chair of audit and risk be deleted and it remains then that the finance performance and assets committee chairs be appointed to assist and the development of the business case. I'll, I'll move. Looking for a seconder to that. Councillor Dalgetty, are you seconding that? Um, I'll speak to it very quickly. Um, it has been pointed out that it's probably better if the Chief Executive and I stay out of this um, in terms of you know, political agendas. Um, it is important that Finance and Chair uh, would be the finance and assets of the two representatives, so I'm quite happy with this. <coughs> Any further questions or speakers to it? No. Put it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. Recommendation eight. Sorry, it's your report, I suppose you should be putting the... <laughs> you wish to speak to it? Uh, no, I already have your worship. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Recommend... Move. Recommendation eight moved by um, the Chair of Assets, confirming the sequencing of Martin and Taipei Civic Centre developments is consistent with the Council's long term plan, etc. Looking for a seconder to that. Thank you, Councillor Gordon, seconding. Uh, do you wish to speak to the motion, Councillor? Uh, no, you worship. I think it's fairly straightforward. Any speakers to the motion? <coughs> this is as it is set down in our long-term plan, so it's literally just um, backing up long-term plan position. Right, I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. Thank you. Ms. Morris, for your worship, could move to 10.1, page 96. Thank you very much. So this is the 10.1 uh, 96. This is the submission to central governments on three waters reform, which includes the uh, tabled copies. Yes. Has everybody got tabled copies in front of them? This is the proposed letter to Minister Mahuta. Uh, it will go to the Department of Internal Affairs, yes. Yeah. And it will be formatted as. Yeah. Has anybody not seen this? I think all councillors, you've had copies of this email to you. I'd just like some hands up, please, that you have seen the document. Yes. Thank you. Um, Your Worship, I might just give a, a very quick brief on the development of this. Um, this was uh, information that was derived through uh, our elected member workshops, meetings, conversations, etc., um, principally, um, and uh, through through the many forums that you and I have attended, which I believe that elected members agreed to. Uh, I held off this being a paper because we wanted to have a public uh, also to comment. You'll see the community feedback on the final page, but the community feedback of the 269 responses we got was uh, largely aligned to elected member feedback during the, the preceding process. Uh, so that's why I've had a very small addition for um, community feedback at the end of the report. Thank you. I'll foreshadow that I'll have a third recommendation and that recommendation will be that um, the submission to central government on the three waters reform gets posted as part of our um, that's the word I'm looking for. Online. Posted online. Do you want 
Territory Council website. So that's just foreshadowed. So would somebody like to move recommendation one that we receive the submission? So we're receiving it as a document to council. Councillor Belsham's moving. Uh, Councillor Ash is seconding. Any discussion? Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, stop me if this is the wrong time to say this, but there are a few, a couple, three things that I think um, could be highlighted within this letter to government. Perhaps in the first instance, Councillor, we're just receiving it. Um, and could you save that for recommendation two for that discussion? Thank you. Uh, because that would be approving the final submission, if you like. It, it, nobody have any further problem about receiving? I'll put the vote. Those in favour? <coughs> those against? Carried. Thank you. Recommendation two, that following feedback at the council meeting, the council approve the final submission to central government on three waters reform, noting it will be sent on the 30th September. Um, I'll move from the chair, seconded by... Sorry, Worship, there is an error. An error. Um, that yeah. should say 1st of October. Uh, yeah. Granted. <coughs> Noting that it will be sent on the 1st of October. I'll move from the chair that we approve. Um, looking for a seconder to that. And it just opens up the discussion. So, Councillor Lambert will take you as the seconder. Um, I'd just like to, in terms of noting the feedback, um, I'd really like to thank councillors and staff for the huge amount of time that has been put into this. So literally thousands of hours have gone into trying to understand where the Three Waters is at. And we need to submit. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Chief Executive for drafting a very balanced um, submission back, a letter back to Minister Mahuta. Open the floor up, Councillor Duncan. Thank you. Um, so. With the um, webinars that we've been privy to over the last, uh, during this week, um, there were three points that were reinforced um, during those uh, that I really would like some sort of inclusion in this letter, um, um, given that the committee agrees. Uh, one of the things with TAS Water was they were very clear about the fact that there are 29 councils, and I believe that we we're about 29 in our uh, entity B, all have a vote, and those votes are um, equally uh, weighted. So, which gives the small and the large councils um, some sort of parity and voice, which I think has been we've discussed throughout. Um, that we are concerned that we won't have a voice being the little guy at the bottom of the, of the map. Um, I, I wonder if that could be included somewhere in number two, governance. Yep. Um, B, uh, sorry, D, where it says it has too many layers and insufficient opportunity for local input, effective representation and ensuring accountability back to the community served. Uh, perhaps there, uh, it might be included that uh, an equal vote for each council included in each entity or our entity um, be included you, in the model. If, if the change was to be adopted, could you consider that change to be a, around the words? Um, um, it has too many layers and insufficient opportunity for local input, effective representation, and ensuring accountability back on an equal basis for each council. Just some words like that. Is that yes. what you're proposing? It's your, yes. it's your request, not mine. Well, yes, that, that would um, definitely, that says what, we, what my concern would be. But in fact, would it not also be valid to give an example of how that might work by as uh, by saying actually a vote for each council that was on 
um, an equal footing would address that concern to some degree. I'm not quite sure how that wording would go. Well, it, it, it's your action, Councillor. You would need to give me the words and then it would need to be moved as an amendment to the document, uh, seconded and carried. So I just, in the first instance, I'd need the words you're requiring. Uh, so uh, could it be, um, once again, in D, uh, too many layers, et cetera, effective representation could be addressed by an equal vote from each uh, one vote per council that would help ensure accountability back to the community served. Okay, uh, so that would become, if that was successful, that would become point E. Is that your view? Uh, we have a point E. Um, or would it just be added to the representation, the layers of insufficient opportunity? How would you like to see that portrayed? Yes, so I would like D rewritten to say it has too many layers and insufficient insufficient opportunity for local input, comma, effective representation could or should be addressed by enabling each council one vote within the entity. Let me to go to this with uh, Ash, if that's okay. It's yeah. quite a change. It would be helpful if maybe if even if the council could write it. Oh, no, we'll write it this way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right. I'm just okay. just working with with staff here to get the wording you want um, before we can proceed further. Um, it is too many layers and insufficient opportunity for local input. Effective representation, yep, could be addressed by an equal vote, one vote per council. I think that's what she said. Uh, comma, and ensuring accountability. That would ensure accountability back to the community served. Yeah. Uh, or that would help address accountability back to the community served. I'm happy for staff to play with that. I, I can't play with it, Your Worship. I need to have what you asked me to, to put in. Okay. Yeah, okay. Effective representation. Um, I was happy with that first, but should be or could be could be addressed by each council having one vote. Sorry, do you want to read it back to me? Sorry, I'm, now now I'm confused. <laughs> so the, the proposed amendment um, that we have written down is for section two D to replace current two D with the following. It has too many layers and insufficient opportunity for local input, comma, effective representation could be addressed by an equal vote, colon, semicolon, one vote per council and ensuring accountability back to the community served. Um, the concern I have with this is around one vote at what stage of governance? Mm. <coughs> um, you know, we do not have a vote, and nor will a council have a vote on the entity board. I would be personally, I'd be hesitant about putting this in because the minister is likely to say, exactly what are you talking about here? If I'm brutally frank. Um, when you talk about one vote, where is that vote going to be expressed? Um, I believe from what I... Yes, I would have to go back and check. But it was representation... Um, the representation level in the layers of... The, the new layers that are proposed. There is a... Um, staff may be be able to remind me, but it was uh, the level up from local government and, and um, tangata whenua, there is a representation level there that then goes into the, uh, the board that, that elects 
the entity board. So I just I just wonder, councillor, whether where governance two D is it has too many layers and insufficient opportunity for local input, effective representation, and ensuring accountability back to back equally to each community and council. Is what you're trying to achieve. But the moment you start putting voting rights in, I think that it gets lost in a wilderness. Uh, yes, I think in that case, um, you wish uh, that we could um, use the word equally. Yep, that would satisfy the intent. Okay, so, the, so if you'd like to type as I speak. Mm, yeah, we've got this motion here, we can amend that. Perhaps. We'll go straight from the start. Okay. So, no, we'll start again. So, 2D governance would read as amended, it has too many layers and insufficient opportunity for local input, comma, effective representation and ensuring accountability equally back to each council and community serve. Sorry, could you please repeat that a little bit? Oh, I've got it, I've got it. So, um, so on, on, on this one, there's an insufficient opportunity for local input, effective representation, and ensuring accountability equally back to the community served. Then one would change. Equally back to each council and community served, or would you be happy with that as you're moving that as an amendment? Yes, thank you. Looking for a seconder to it. Is there a, is there a seconder back to the amendment? I'm sorry, it fails. Are you seconding, Councillor Gordon? You're on mute. Apologies. Yes, yes, I'm seconding to keep it alive. Okay. Um, do you consider that you have spoken to it or do you wish to outline further your concern? Councillor Duncan. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I think I've probably spoken to it, just that that, that was um, on several occasions, the people who were involved, including the, um, the Mayor of uh, Tasmania, Jan Bond, um, said that this was, this was something that they really valued, the fact that all the councils, the little councils were able to be done equally to the larger bodies. Okay, any other speakers to the motion? to replace D with 2D? No? Uh, so there's no other speakers against it, so you lose your effectively your right to reply. I'll put it to a vote. Those in favour of the amendment? One, one, two, three, four, hang on. One, Councillor Ash, you're voting for it. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven. All right, the amendment succeeds. Um, and it now becomes this part of the substantive document when adopted. Any further changes that councillors want to the letter? Sorry, councillor, I wasn't getting at you in terms of the vote thing. It's just, it would raise questions as to exactly what you're intending. Any further changes? Councillor Duncan. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the two other things I have um, that have been brought up, especially again by Taswater, the one, uh, the first thing is the ombudsman um, and their function. They seem to think that this was very important. 
and I haven't actually identified apart from somewhere under governance whether this should be a requested a special water ombudsman or whether the existing ombudsman should actually have their powers um, broadened to include the water space. Uh, I don't know what the rest of the council believe, but they did say that the, count, the ombudsman's position within their um, water reforms has become, has been very, very important. So yeah, I'm, just, I'm just trying to see where that, under what section would you see that footing in? I, I would suspect that it would have to be under governance as well. Um, perhaps while scale, scale might be, may be important to enable efficiency gains on the work. Earlier, I would have thought the um, would become under financial impacts of anywhere around um, around costs. I wouldn't see it as a governance issue. I would see it as a financial issue if you were going to go there around transparency and fairness, because are you proposing that the ombudsman would have a similar role around um, pricing? Because it's be effectively a complaint procedure. Yes, very much so. So I see what you mean. And so um, you're talking about financial impacts, uh, C, this needs to make clear the degree of transparency. Is that, is that where you'd see that? Uh, if you were going to do it, that would be my preference in that area. But I might just ask for uh, the Chief Executive's opinion in here. Um, I want the Chief Executive to be part and parcel of this discussion, having worked extensively in this area. Peter, do you have a view? <laughs> Sorry, Your Worship. No, I, I, I don't. Um, if it's a, if it's a question on whether or not the ombudsman should be a standalone water ombudsman, or if it should be included in New Zealand's office of the ombudsman, um, if if elected members have a preference or feedback, then I'll put it in the letter. For, for me, I don't see it as an issue that has been raised thus far um, by elected members or in any conversation I've had. It acknowledges that an ombudsman might be important. I don't believe it's going to be a, a, a fundamental part of this document. The question I'd ask then is, in the survey results from the community, has this been raised as an issue? I don't believe so. Okay. We can check. Just um, in, in terms of, first of all, um, the ombudsman's position will always remain there. Really, the question is whether you want a dedicated ombudsman purely relating to the three waters. Is that what you're seeking? No, um, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm just responding to what was quite clearly said. And I believe they do have a dedicated ombudsman. And I'm not... Uh, I'm, I'm not um, worried about whether he's dedicated or not, but that his, that his position and power is available for those people who, who need, um, who have complaints and need, uh, need support. I, my understanding of the ombudsman, ombudsman position is that you would always have the opportunity to, to go to the ombudsman. Um, my advice is I don't think that would be necessary at this stage, um, but it's, it's up to you. No, thank you. Uh, and I have heard what the Chief Executive has said, and, um, and that's absolutely fine if he doesn't believe that this is the right place okay. for the right time. Um, the, only, the last thing I have, sorry, is the local supply chain, and I wonder if um, that might be brought up in... Other issues, E. Yeah. Can you tell me? Have you got any words around it? No. So this is under other issues, six. Yes. Workforce six and capability. That's right. And actually, um, I have to say that rereading this, ensuring local delivery footprint, 
Um, I believe that's been covered, so I'll withdraw that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, councillors, any other changes that you would wish to make to this document? Councillor Gordon and Councillor Ash have their hands Councillor up. Gordon, I'll take you first, then Councillor Ash. Thank you, I had to have Councillor Okay, so, so this is a, it's a big picture question for Chief Executive, really. Um, one of the drivers that government, central government has put forward is around economies of scale. And I really wonder whether having four entities as they've laid out gives us appropriate economies of scale um, for purchasing and for the creation of what I might call a brains trust. Um, and I'll give, I'll give two examples. Um, in the purchasing space, we have one agency that purchases drugs on New Zealand's behalf. It's called Pharmac. And they go out into the big wide world and they play hardball with um, pharmaceutical companies to our benefit. I would expect that if we were to have similar purchasing grunt, we'd want one agency to go out there and take on the multinationals that supply all the stuff like pipes and pumps and all the kit that we need in the space. I think having four agencies possibly not always working together would undermine that position. So I just wonder whether that has to be flagged. Um, and the second item I raised was, how do we get four agencies working together to form a bit of a brains trust? You know, if we wind the clock back 30 years, we had the Ministry of Works that employed the best engineers in the country and out of the world. And they did things like pulling together hydro schemes and the national grid and all those really big infrastructure projects, we had a brains trust where we put the best thinking in the country into one space and let them get on with the job. At the moment, we have 67 entities trying to do it individually by employing consultants. And now we're heading towards four entities. I just wonder whether, again, we're splitting our resources. Um, and is that, just... is that portrayed in... I can't really see where that's been portrayed in the letter. Um, and it hasn't been because that hasn't been a, an issue raised by the council. If you're saying that you want this letter to be to be altered to to, um, to the stage where you're suggesting there should be one entity, not four, um, you'd need to express that, and we'd have a vote on it. Um, Perhaps we can do this by intent. First of all, is that your intent, that you want one entity, not four, if it was to go ahead? I, I think if we were to, wanting to achieve the sort of economies of scale that we need in the places where we need it, that would be my intent. Would you be happy at this stage whether we had a straw poll to see if that was the feeling of council? Yeah, yeah look, I'm happy for that. I suspect that this might be part of the discussion that happens anyway long term coming out of this, but so, I'm happy. So before we formalise this, um, councillors, could I have a show of hands to who would entertain that as a view, that there was one entity, not four? Can I ask a question on that, please? Certainly. So is that um, an entity that would do the whole shebang, so from purchasing and delivery, or would that potentially be um, one organisation that would have the buying power and uh, that ability to make those sort of efficiencies while still allowing um, the, gov the, the, the local governments, the, the, um, the councils around the country? to be a part of that and still carry on delivering their three waters? No, what Councillor Gordon is suggesting is that entities A, B, C and D be combined, one. Into, be combined into one entity. Yeah, no. May I um, pick a couple of words in here, Your Worship? Um, yeah, I'm, oh, look, I would be flexible. I think this is part of the problem with the whole discussion. There's been one solution rammed in. And really, I think that we need to have a far more ranging discussion, wide ranging discussion. And so I would be happy if we had a purchasing entity and a brain trust entity that helped all the others out, or at the other end of the extreme where we just have one entity. 
and perhaps regional groups operating under it. it what, what we want is the best solution. And I'm trying to sort of flag that. And I don't know whether, I don't know whether in the, in the letter the Chief Exec has pulled together, whether we're flagging that well enough. I'm just, and I'm using this as an example. Well, I, I just have to get an outcome out of this meeting because we're obliged to report back to the minister today. Um, that's that's the undertaking we have been given. Um, if you want a change to the extent that there is one entity, not four, you need to be very clear about that. And that's why I suggested in terms of time to see how much, how many of the councillors are prepared to support that position. Perhaps you better have a show of hands quickly. Yeah. But I have a show of hands. Those who would prefer us to include in the letter that the entities be reduced from four to one. I'm I sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> cut the mustard. Um, but thank you for your concern. Councillor Ash. Councillor Ash next. Um, so just one uh, initial thing um, that I'd like to raise is I take your point that it's a, a great balanced um, letter, but I wonder if it's a little bit too too balanced. It um, The last bit in regards to the feedback from the community, I don't think uh, really reflects the entire picture. And obviously we're all aware we've been swamped with um, communication coming through in the past few weeks from the community, all that uh, I haven't had a single um, person communicate with me that they're in favour of any of this um, and I think that needs to be um, transmitted to the to the government really really clearly that uh, our communities are not on board with this at all um, and maybe highlight some of the points that they've they've raised very very valid points um, I, th I, I just think that um, Councillor Ash, the last line of community feedback says overwhelmingly the majority of survey uh, respondents are opposed. Um, the survey responses um, included. Um, I think I wonder if, if Councillor Ash is referring to the feedback that elected members have been receiving, yep. whether it be by email or conversations in the street or anecdotally uh, on the proposed. And what I've tried to do is capture that in a more formal sense as opposition that, that you've fed back through the various conversations I've had with you, the various emails you've sent to me, uh, our workshops, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't explicitly stated it, but I've, I've covered it through here of instead of saying we don't agree, but we've been brought a sense um, that I've put in all the concerns that you've brought back to me that, the, that people have come back. I felt that addressing the concerns and the proposals were a better way of giving feedback than we just oppose. Mm. T totally hear you there. Um, I, I do think it's, it's vital that we actually strengthen that last bit about our feedback from the communities. And part of the feedback has been that the, the um, survey didn't give them enough scope to really have a, have a say. So, um, yeah, I, I just think we could put more weight how, there to... How to, do you wish to strengthen that last sentence, uh, Councillor? Scroll down to it. Um, well, maybe include at the end of it a couple of the points, I mean, from some of the communications we've been having come through on the email, even just add a couple of the sentences from there. These are the kind of concerns that the community have. We have, our community has shown absolutely no confidence in the proposal um, right. to date. So how about we include a sentence at the end that says, um, Minister, um, we have received um, a huge number of of emails subsequent to the subsequent to the this letter being initially drafted, 
they have been 100% um, telling us to we should not be party to this reform. Mm. Maybe, Richard, I could add something, maybe a bit shorter there. In the final sentence, I could add, um, currently it says overwhelmingly the majority of survey respondents, comma, and feedback to our elected members, comma, are opposed to the proposed reform. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think clearly stating that there is no confidence um, from the community in this proposal. Yeah, so you'd like the words included that there is no confidence from the community that to support this proposal? Yes, I'd okay. like that. Do you want to put some words there? Uh, so Sorry. That's all right. So we started out by saying, uh, um, Councillor Belsham, you said in Yeah, about overwhelmingly the vast majority. So that's pretty much... Oh, okay. Overwhelmingly, the vast majority of several respondents, comma, comma, including feedback directly to council elected members, have no confidence yeah. on this reform, comma, have no confidence. In the proposed reform. In the proposed reform and are opposed to it. Yeah. Um, could you read that back to Councillor Ash before typing to see if she'd be prepared to support the. I thought Ash was typing. I, I was. I typed oh, good it. work. Okay. Can you dump it on there? Sorry. Yes. Councillor, can you see, <coughs> Councillor Ash, can you see that amendment as written? Can I read it to you? So amendment two would be to replace the last sentence of the community feedback with, inverted commas, overwhelmingly, comma, the vast majority of survey respondents, comma, including feedback directly to councillors elected members, comma, have no confidence in this reform and are opposed to it. It's a pretty strong statement. Would you, are you happy with that? <laughs> Listening to you read it, it is very strong. Um, having said that though, that is exactly what I'm getting. I've had, um, everybody's in agreement that yes, something needs to happen. Something needs to change. Currently the way things are being delivered is not is not giving us the, the result we need. Um, but okay, nobody, just, nobody on, has, on. has shown confidence. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with it being as strong as it is. Okay. We're looking for a second to that amendment. I'm happy to second it. Councillor Belsham's happy to second. Can I then take what you have said as speaking to the, the amendment? Any other speakers to the amendment? Otherwise, I'll put it to a vote. Right, I'll put it to a vote. Those in favour, can you please raise your hands? Everybody is in favour. So that become that final sentence be, replaces, and it now becomes a substantive motion, which is the letter. Councillor Dalgetty. Um, I'm just wondering. Uh, I don't think we can. I can find in the letter around the risk to our council if. Um, this new entity strips us of our assets and therefore our ability to um, borrow un, you know, with what's left. Yeah. Um, councillors, by the way, it would have been much easier if councillors had written out um, some sort mm -hmm. of proposed track change 
Um, however, where do you see your concern being addressed, Councillor? Um, either financial impacts or other issues. I mean, I just does other people feel that's a significant enough risk to address it? Um, let me think. Sorry, I'll just go back and look at this is under five financial impacts. And what you're wanting is concern around the loss of our assets in some shape. How do you, how do you want this worded? So concern around the risk to council with the loss of assets that they will not be able to uh, um, that their debt limit will be re re reduced, so we won't be able to continue doing what we, you know, had planned in our long-term plan. Yes, the first statement, yeah. yeah. So I tried to capture that. Yeah. yeah, which statement do you want to use? Uh, 5A was the one where I tried to capture that. Yeah, okay. so, uh, Councillor, um, 5A has tried to under understand that position by saying, we understand and support the concept of no council being worse off financially as a result of the proposed reforms. However, there remains a lack of clarity on the financial and asset impacts of the reforms. Does that not capture that? In the next okay, sentence. yeah, that's, that's fine, yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything else before we look to bed this down? Councillor Duncan. Uh, I just want to say this is an excellent letter and thank you very much to staff. All right, so when we're now, we now have the substantive motion moved by myself, uh, Councillor Lambert, seconding. Um, I don't think I need to speak further to it. I think, um, councillors, if we, you wish to express a view, um, now would be the time to do so. And I'll take your view, councillor, that you've um, just given. I think this is a very, very clear message to, to government and our community that we have significant concerns. Councillor Ash. So the process, just putting some clarity, process going on from here. Um, so we, we send this letter in. Yeah. What, and I know, sorry, this is probably just a, a moot point anyway. What is the next step? I mean, we don't know anything. We haven't, it's all been very ambiguous so, and vague. So each council, each council has been asked or given the opportunity to submit back to the minister. Mm -hmm. uh, the entities have also been given that opportunity, the draft entities. Um, the minister then will look at these and come out with some form of response. Um, then there are two sort of pathways from that. One is that the minister and government may decide we've listened to what you've had to say and we will just mandate and make this law. Following down that pathway, it's then a matter of whether communities and the council want to express their disappointment or anger in that process. The second option is that it proceeds down the line that councils still have the ability to opt out. Um, so with that in mind, we would have a clear path, presumably, to go back and consult more fully with our communities. Literally, we could say, this is the vote in front of us. Please indicate whether you're yes or no. Uh, how we consult would be up to us, um, but that would be the second pathway that flowed out of that. Then ultimately, if you went down that pathway, Council would need to make a decision as to whether to opt out. I suspect there will be a hybrid of this. I suspect what will happen is the Minister may well come back and say, 
I would like to take a little bit further look at this, to take some more time over it, or uh, to establish some of the inter some of the systems around a possible transition without enacting it. There could be all sorts of hybrids, but that would be effectively um, a putting off a firm decision. So further to that, that's kind of where my question was going. We state in the letter, obviously, it was written that really there was only this one, one um, proposal. Um, at what point do they look at what other options are actually available? I mean, similar to having one entity that is the buying power while um, local councils retain their their deliverables or what have you is is there a point at okay which and um, this is this is not council's proposal this is the proposal put out by government <laughs> oh very obviously aware of that Andy. Uh, yeah I'm not, I, I'm not trying to tell you um so it's up to the 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 balls of the minister's court every council is expressing a series of concerns as we have and then it's up to the minister as to whether the minister is prepared to alter their proposal on the basis of these concerns. Okay, thank you. Councillor Belsham. Yeah, look, um, this is a well put together letter and I think in a nutshell, the, the general public out there think we're giving away these assets and they're going to a large organisations that we're going to lose complete control over the ability to have any say. This letter really drills down on every concern that's been raised by elected members and in general and from the public. So you know, I think this is, this is hugely informative to head back to the minister. And it does, it relays our concerns and our public's concerns. And I think at this stage, that's all we've got the ability to do, um, is listen to the, listen to the uh, rate payers of our community. And we've, we have, you know, they feel like we're losing control of these assets if, uh, if this entity goes ahead. And this letter basically drills down on all of those concerns. So I think, um, you know, this will be hugely beneficial. Yeah, just further to the, what would happen um, in terms of council's decision, the government may make several suggestions and say, these are the concerns that have been raised. This is how they're going to be dealt with. And um, there may well be a large number of councils, including potentially ours, would say, these concerns have now been addressed um, and we're more comfortable with the financial position um, that's inherent to these proposals. So who knows where this goes next? Right, I'll now put it to the vote. Um, those in favour? This is in favour of this letter going. Thank you. Would the record please uh, show that all were in favour. So no against uh, carried. I'll move to recommendation three that the, from me that the submission to central government on three waters reform is posted on the council website. I'll move. You finish this one more thing. I'll just ask you. Sorry. I'll yeah. let you finish this. Yeah. Are you seconding council Dougherty? Thanks. Those in favour? Carried. Thank you. I think we have an obligation to be transparent in our position. Just the mechanics of this, Your Worship, you may, considering I'm anticipating that this will be a letter on mayoral letterhead on your signature. Correct. Did you want particularly a recommendation for that? Yeah. Um, councillors, this would be a letter that goes onto our website with my signature. Councillors, do you wish to have your signatures attached to this letter that is sent to the minister and to be on the website? So some councils have come out very strongly and said, um, this is our position and effectively by everybody signing it, it shows that to the minister that 
all are in favour. That's your call. So I, can I have some sense of direction around this? Your Worship, for me personally, I don't believe that's necessary. We've recorded in the minutes that it was a unanimous decision by this council to support it. Some councillors may feel the need to have that on there, but I don't see the need to have that. It is simply endorsing a letter to the minister um, at this point in time, and at this stage does not uh, does not need to deem a decision by this council either. Okay. okay. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Councillor Ash next. Councillor Duncan. Thank you. I have an opposing view. I think that I uh, I have received some of these letters. I've seen them, and it I think it lends greater weight when you can see that everyone's taken the um, the trouble to sign it, and I think that especially. Um, when um, our mayor has had to front everything on his own, it would be, it'd be nice to see that he is supported by his um, army of supporters. My battalion. <laughs> Councillor Ash. Yeah, just uh, exactly as, as Councillor Duncan um, just said, I, I do believe it actually adds a bit more weight when there's the signatures of everybody. But if we weren't to do that, um, because it may be tricky to get all our signatures on, I have absolutely no idea. Um, uh, just stating it in the letter that, you know, it was unanimous around the can table. I a, can I have a show of hands as to how many councillors wish to see their signature at attached to the letter, please. One. Is that a scratch or is that a vote? Councillor Hera. You're on mute. Um, one, two, three. Um, I'm, I'm happy. Well, if, if, it's a, if, it, if we're all going to do it, then we should all do it. If we aren't all going to do it, then I'm, I, I'm not fussed about having my, my name on it, to be honest. No, the feeling around the room is uh, people aren't fussed around it, so no, it'll just go as a letter. Um, be noted that we're all in support, um, etc. I think that deals with all of that. I think we can now move on. Um, this is, we're now moving into 10.2. This is the least, requ least request for the Bulls Town Library, the Bulls Library, their old one. Um, we have a recommendation. I wonder, if, first of all, let's see how quickly this could proceed. Would somebody like to move the receipt of the information? The <coughs> Councillor Carter moving. Councillor Hero seconding. I'll put it straight to a vote. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. Is anybody prepared to put up a recommendation to we either enter or do not enter into a lease? I'm happy to move. You're happy to move? Yeah, the council does enter into a lease. A seconder, Councillor Hero. Do we need the question that I'd have of of the Chief Executive is would we need to have something in there to say in accordance with the letter that was the request that was presented to us because it is quite specific around a term of lease being 99 years and $1. Gailene will probably want to answer that. It's been in the paper. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I addressed the term of the lease. Sorry, I just need to find it. In one of the recommendations, um, suggesting that it be for 35 years or less. More than 35 years, a lease can be considered a subdivision. Okay, that makes sense. So yes, we could deal with recommendation two as it sits in my view. Any speakers to this? Uh, Councillor Wilson, um, you moved it. Do you wish to speak to it? Are you happy to put it to a vote, councillors? Yes. Put, sorry, Councillor Gordon. Uh, yes, Your Worship. I, I think it's important that if, we, if we're voting yes, then we also need to um, pass all the other bits of the, um, all the other recommendations as well because I think there's some key risks um, with this building. 
and we almost should be starting at five and working our way back. It's recommendation five because that's where the meat is. It's making sure that the potential tenant carries out all the other work that's needed and um, can't. But okay. I, I accept your view, but these would effectively become conditions in the lease, so I'm prepared to let it ride at the moment. So in effect, recommendation two is an intent. And so I'm prepared to let it lie as it sits. Do I have an objection to that ruling by any councillor? No, put it to the vote. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. Recommendation three, that the public car parking areas at the rear of 73 High Street, boom, 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 do not form part of the lease with Bulls and District Historical Society, and that they remain available as a public car parking space. Councillor Duncan, are you moving? Councillor Carter, are you seconding? Thank you. Do you wish to speak to this, Councillor Duncan? No. You happy, councillors, you happy this goes straight to a vote? Yes. Put it to the vote. Those in favour? No. Those against? Motion is carried. Recommendation four, that to, due to the very high life safety risk rating, the building at 73 High Street Bulls is not to be open to the public until all seismic strengthening work has been completed. Ooh. Um, so just put a little bit of context or a question to me around this. So current, I'm just currently the law would say that they would have 15 years to bring this up to code. Exactly. From the time of identification under the earthquake prone legislation, I just wonder where this has come from because effectively this could potentially hamstring this. So the building is compliant as it stands for public occupation, um, but is deemed earthquake prone. So they would have 15 years from the time of notification that it was earthquake prone to bring it up to standard. I'm just wondering why we would insist that it should be done before anybody walks into the building. Just perhaps a possible correction there, and I could be wrong, but it is a council building, even though it's subleased, it's only 7.5 years. I don't believe it's 15 years as a council building. It is still listed as a council library, so therefore it will be 7.5 years, would it not? It only becomes a council, it only be, gets shortened to seven and a half years if it has a core responsibility to council infrastructure, et cetera. So if it is being used as an administration centre in terms of things like a civil defence unit, then that's the, the reason to cut it back from 15 years to seven and a half years. I just bear in mind that we have a large number of facilities, and I'll go to Gail in a second. We have a large number of council owned facilities that are earthquake prone that we have people in. So, why would we put that as a standard, is my question to staff, when we're not invoking that standard ourselves? Gail Ann. So my suggested recommendation has come about through section 3.4. Um, and the initial assessment that Kevin O'Connor and Associates produced. So on page 100, I've included the table for the building grading system for the earthquake risk. Um, the KOA assessment resulted in a percentage rating for an MBS new building standard of 10, which is for a life safety risk, very high risk. And that was my reasoning for including that officer recommendation. So the risk position of this building that we have a large number of staff and, and the general public in, is at a similar place, isn't it? I haven't got the exact um, percentage MBS in front of me, 
for 46 High Street, sorry. But, uh, it, is, it is in that region, isn't it? It's in the high, it has a very low, uh, that's, it's just what I'm getting at. Uh, sorry, I'm starting to argue the point of the motion. Um, is somebody prepared to, to move recommendation four? I've got a question. Or uh, well, given that this has been, um, so the information is there, given that this actually uh, affects pretty much ev all of our buildings, wouldn't it be a, 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 are we able just to keep that to the side until we find out what the status is across the board? How do you mean the status across the well, board? Well, you're, you're talking about our the, the buildings that, that the council owns. So instead of guessing what it is, wouldn't it be better for us to actually? Would that make a difference? Because if we're going to be if we're going to be saying that this is the standard for one place, why wouldn't it be the standard across the board? And without knowing all the information, how can we make that? Um, how can we make that decision? That's exactly. Um, I'll I'll argue this. All right, I'll argue that, so it's on the table, that recommendation four is not adopted. So I don't actually need that because unless somebody actually moves it to be adopted, it doesn't exist anyway. Councillor Ash. Councillor Ash. Uh, just a question, please. Certainly. Um, what does the historical society make of this? Have they seen that recommendation and, and made comment on it? I did ring Mr. Sharland on Monday just to advise him that the report was going to council. And I asked him if he could have access to the website to see it. And he said he was going to. Um, I invited him to come back to me if he had any comments or questions and I haven't heard anything back. Sorry, just further to that, so it wasn't actually pointed out that there was this recommendation for that he may want to have a close look at. I explained that the report was there and he was going to go on and have a look at it. That was the conversation, just to let him know. But in the conversation, we didn't go through the report item by item, no. Well, put it this way, is somebody prepared to move recommendation four? If not, it just dies. Councillor Gordon, are you prepared to move recommendation four? I have a question. Um, does anybody have any information on the sort of um, cost that it might be expected to bring a building of that nature up to a, a standard of uh, modern design code that we would expect? I mean, it's a, basically a single story house. A bit of description. In the paragraph um, above section four, there we had an indicative estimate, but that was back in 2013, and it was 170,000 at that time. Okay, thank you. Councillor Duncan. Thank you. My my question is that um, if we if we um, move and second this and then discuss it and it is lost, is that not a better um, outcome than just not doing it at all? That, that, that's up to you. I'm quite happy to discuss it, but I need some, as chair, I need someone to move a motion on the floor. Otherwise, otherwise it just doesn't exist. Um, Councillor's time is ticking, please. <coughs> Councillor Ash. Yeah, sorry, just another... Uh, this isn't sitting right with me if I don't actually understand um, how the Historical Society feels about all of this, because then if we go on to um, number five, that the Bulls and District Historical Society be responsible for including funding of the seismic strengthening of the building to achieve, blah, blah, percentage of new building standard, and that the... All of this, 
it would be not nice to have clarity and confirmation from the society that they're happy to take this on this is quite an, um, a major undertaking and obviously we want any any building that they're going to use to be safe um but this is putting all of the onus on them um to get it all up to scratch and i don't know that we've actually heard back from the society that they're fully aware of all of this and yeah we may end up being in a situation where we've got a building that's ends Councilor, up being stagnant. So what they have said is that they are prepared to enter into a lease for 99 years and that they would bring it up to scratch. Now, if they have a lease within 99 years, then they would have an obligation to comply with the regulations, earthquake prone regulations, which to me means that the earthquake prone status would have to be um, resolved um, within the legal time frame. What I am concerned at is if you put this in, two things. One, that they haven't got the money to do it immediately, and so nothing happens. Or two, that we are insisting on one standard for a community building when we're not adhering to the same standard on our buildings. So unless somebody's prepared to move a motion in the in the next 30 seconds, I'll move on. Councillor Gordon. I'd like to know um, what is our liability as the owner of that building if we tenant if we lease it out to someone else um, in an unsafe when it's unsafe, we know it's not safe. Um, and they fail to bring it up to whatever the percent of modern code is. Are we still liable as a council or do we pass the liability on to them? You may, you or me, because I have a very strong view about this. Oh, okay. okay, my understanding would be that if we lease it out to them, um, they have an absolute right to occupy it under the current earthquake prone legislation. If we decide not to lease it out to them because we're concerned about their their safety, that's that's our prerogative. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, this is about intent. Do we want them to do this or not? If we decide that we should not be, it comes down to exactly the same position I've had before. So if we decide that we don't want people in the building because it is unsafe then it raises a real question mark in my mind around the same standard should apply for us, for buildings we own. Because they are in very similar standards. Um, yeah, uh, something for you, for the members perhaps to consider is that I, I, I um, have wanted this recommendation to be in there. Um, as a chief executive, I am responsible for the buildings um, and uh, I am responsible for all my staff and the public that enter into council buildings. And we have um, an assessment on the building run now. Um, we are working on assessments of other buildings to make sure that we are fully informed, or I am fully informed, as to where I wish uh, my staff to work. Um, this is uh, not about my staff so much as uh, us going into a lease on a building that, again, falls under my jurisdiction. Um, as a, in terms of health and safety responsibility, the report identifies this is a very high risk building, the lowest standard you can get. Uh, and the intent of this recommendation is on the balance of what the conversations we've had with the historical society is that <coughs> they want to get in there, strengthen the building, put their um, memorabilia, et cetera, into it and that as a, a trust, they could attract funding that perhaps council couldn't. Now, this is saying, we just need you to do that work before you fill it up and put people in it. That, that's the intent. Um, and that would be my wish as chief executive from a, the safe perspective of a building that we would lease. <clears throat> as I said, councillors, I need someone to put a motion on the table. Otherwise, I'll just move on. I'm happy to move motion if somebody would second it. I'll second it. Oh, finally. 
Do you wish to speak to the yeah, I do wish to speak to it. Um, the Chief Executive has said exactly what I was thinking. We cannot con contract out of our rights and responsibilities for the safety of this building, no matter what we put in place as far as a lease is concerned. We are last man standing and we take responsibility of it. If it was 10% in 2013, I can assure you of one thing, it has certainly not got any better uh, with regards to its uh, earthquake strengthening. You know, that's uh, seven, eight years ago now, and we've had a couple of several little shakes between there, so it's probably getting, going to be looking worse. It's a current NBS national building standard. They were completely different back in 2013 to what they are now. So um, we heard from Mr Sharlan this morning. He's extremely enthusiastic about the support that he's going to get from the people of Bulls. They are aware of what's required to strengthen that um, uh, that building, and, and, and they seem very positive that it was going to be quite a simple project. Uh, process for them. I don't think there's anything untoward with uh, recommendation four as what it is. I think it should be voted on, endorsed, supported and moved on so that we can complete this lease, get this information back to Mr Shallon and the Bulls and District Society as we have indicated and then we'd be back to with an answer today. Any further speakers to the motion? Councillor Duncan. I would like to make a shadow movement. Can I do that? I can't remember what it's called. Well, you can either have a foreshadowed motion foreshadowed or you can motion. make an amend amendment to the motion. Um, well, what I would like to say is that due to the very high life sa safety risk rating, the building at 73 High Street Bulls should be brought up to all seismic strengthening work. Uh, uh, seismic, all seismic strengthening work should be done strictly as um, to the co to the present code for all buildings. Any further speakers to the motion? I'll speak to the motion. Uh, look, the the historic society, the Bulls um, Museum group, have said that they are willing to cover the cost for the seismic strengthenings and they've had the opportunity to read through this report, I would presume. So I'm quite happy to support the motion and say that's what they they are preparing to deal with the strengthening. So let's put that in there as a requirement and maybe that will help them receive some external funding as well. That That is a requirement before public can enter the building. So I'll support the motion. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak against the motion my concern is not about doing it. My concern is that you may well put them in a position where they say um, that's not practical for us to do immediately, that it, that it will be a four or five year visit to do this. Um, I just don't know their intentions. But I certainly am concerned that effectively we're proposing a standard on other buildings that we don't accept for our own. Um, right of reply? Right of reply. I think the answer to that question and your concerns may well come out of when the Chief Executive enters into a, a lease negotiation with the Bulls and District Society. And that may allay your concerns at that stage. So, The motion's... Oh, sorry, I can't comment. Right, I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? So carried. Um, recommendation five, this is the term. So um, perhaps we run through these in, t in turn. One, that the lease be... Have we got a consensus over the number of years? Does somebody like... To to move. Um, there was a recommendation from uh, Miss Prince around this, which oh. was how many years? 35. 35, 35 years. Five years or less. Yeah. If it's somebody's motion, would somebody like to run down what they would like in it in terms of... I'll, I'll move 35 years, that the term of the lease be, that there be a nominal rental of $1 GST exclusive per year, and that the bulls, sorry, item five on the recommendation uh, that it's brought up to 67% of New Zealand, uh, new building standard. Second that. 
Yeah, that's your motion. So you're moving that, you're seconding it. Um, do you wish to speak to it? Uh, no, it, it pretty much covers the, the information that's been provided in the report. Um, so I'm happy to put those, rec those terms to the lease. Can I just, can I ask a question of you because you're moving the motion? Mm -hmm. Why 67% when 34% under the legislation would give compliance? Sorry, my understanding was 67, 67% was required. If the report says differently, I'm happy to amend it back to the 30. 35, so the report sorry. might indicate 67, but my understanding of the legislation is that compliance for an earthquake prone building would be 34% of code. I just want an explanation as to why you are saying 67. My understanding was if public have access to the building that it had to be up to 67. I'm happy to be corrected. Darlene? Um, I would just need to clarify that. I know all the other buildings we've looked at, we have talked about 67%. Mr. Poynton's online. I'm just wondering if I can check if he knows the legislation. I wonder if Mr. Collis might um, clarify the law with regard to this, because my understanding would be 34% would be compliant. You can have all sorts of other uh, aims and things, but I think 34% is the, the code. Uh, Councillor Ash. Um, just wondering about the 35 years, is that um, being just 35 years, is that going to hinder their ability to get the funding to get the seismic work done if they don't own the building? Just wondering how all that's going to work for them. Sorry, can you repeat the question, Councillor Ash? Uh, a question around the 35 years um, lease. Is that going to hinder their ability to attract funding to get the seismic work done? I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have thought so. They don't, they don't own the building, so just wondering if um, just a 35-year lease is enough to get funding for... If I could answer, I, I may be able to help that. I would have suggested that a 35-year fixed lease is, is, is a significant advantage to them, yeah. Councillor, at 35 years, as opposed to a standard lease, which may be something with 5 plus 5 of rights for renewal, 3 plus 3 after that. So 35 years, I would suggest, is a, uh, is a substantial lease uh, and would be well and truly in their favour. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is someone chasing? Uh, Johan isn't here. Um, Graham. Look, I'm, I'm happy to have that, if it can be put in the recommendation, that it's... Yes, yes. Sorry, okay. Hi there. I wanted to add in, sorry, excuse me. Just... Sorry, I wanted to add in that the legal minimum is 34%, and that since 2017, there are two risk levels one being buildings that are 0 to 20%, and buildings that are 21 to 34%. But 34% is considered the, the legal minimum for a building. Thank you. Is it, sorry, is that up to 34 or was it 35? No, 33 so, is actually. So 33 is, the, is the level, right. The number you'd want to put in here, basically. So I'm happy to alter that to 34%. I'll second that as the second. Well, You're happy with that amendment? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can understand my question. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I can. Okay. Right. Um, did you finish speaking to us? Yes. <laughs> right, other speak. Um, we'll go for right of reply if you like. We short circuit this and there's no other speakers to the lease conditions. Right, we'll put it to a vote then. Those in favour? 
Those against? Carried. Recommendation six is that if council determines that a lease be entered into with the society that the Bulls community be advised that council now will now, not now be considering a design brief for the green space. Look, I'll, I'll so move. Second. Councillor Wilson seconding. Uh, does anybody have a... I don't think I need to speak to this. In other words, they're going to sort it effectively. I'll put it to the vote. Those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? Carried. Um, recommendation seven. Does somebody want to move, presumably, that we permit the erection of the statue? Councillor Duncan moving. Councillor Carter seconding. I think I could put this straight to a vote. Uh, those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. Recommendation eight. That it be for you, Dick. Be a, this is procedural stuff, mm. surely. Yeah. Uh, do we really need this? We can do it. Those, uh, somebody like to move? Look, I'll move. Looking for a second or two. Uh, Councillor Carter. Um, those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. I'm not quite sure we're down at this operational level, to yeah. be honest. Sorry for that. Can I pause for a breath here? Uh, we do have some um, uh, critical uh, decisions to be yeah, made, and I make the point. I'm wondering if I could pause section 10.3, but move to 10.4, and if there's time, we can go back to 10.3. Yeah, what I was going to suggest, I was going to do exactly that. Um, which of the items left in the agenda are absolutely critical to achieve? Um, 10.4, and two papers in public excluded. 10.4, 10.5, 10.6, 10.6, and two papers within public excluded. Okay, so 11 could potentially drop out. Yes. Um, and two papers in. Although I would want, if there was time to prioritise 11, I would like. 11.3, Mr Jones is here and I think there is information that I would like elected members to be familiar with, if it was possible, you wish it. Look, I'll take the advice of the, the operational team, so if you tell me where you would like to go next. Uh, I'd like you to go to 10.4 and then 10.5 then 10.6. I suggest we get Jess in the room, it might be easier. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, thank you. Um, Right, I was just moving straight on to 10.4, the bus lane, town square. This is the revised construction contract. I'm actually, you worship, prepared to move one, two, three, and four on that, and I will speak to you my reasonings behind that. So you're prepared to move 10.4, 10.5. Two, three, and four? Yeah, one for the receipt of two, three, and four, yes. Uh, looking for a second to be able to move them as a block. Um, we'll go Councillor Carter because it's my, uh, because it's Bulls. No, just Sorry, to... Councillor Lambert, I'll come back to you another stage, even yes. though you were first. Uh, she doesn't have to. Okay. <clears throat> Um, just in terms of recommendation two, um, do you wish to give us the further reasoning around, explain the reasoning around um, the contract with ID Lotus? Yes, please. Yes, over to you, please. Hi, thank you. Um, the contract with ID Loaders was procured openly via Tenderlink over a year ago now, about 16 months ago now. Uh, so the procurement policy was fully complied with and ID Loaders uh, contract start was then deferred. So I went through the competitive process, in other words, and that was the decision you've come to. That satisfies me there. Um,
I have no further questions. Anybody else have questions of the report? No. Do you wish to speak to your combined sets? Yeah, just just to um, to reconfirm and thank you, Jess. Uh, yes, this uh, this contract was previously let. It was uh, deferred by this council uh, for reasons that were stated at the time. So I saw no reason uh, to be uh, to be re uh, regurgitating um, this contract. Uh, hence my reasoning for uh, moving the full recommendations as a block to enable us to carry on. Once again, the costs are only going one way and it's certainly not down. Councillors, any other speakers to this? Right, I'll put it straight to a vote. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried, thank you. Moving through to 10.5. This is the Thai Happy Amenities Building. There's the detailed design endorsement. Um, this has been through a number of committees and public consultation. Would somebody like to move some motions, please? Look, I'll do them very quickly separately. Um, one motion to receive, Councillor Gordon moving. Councillor Hero seconding. Those in favour? No. Those against? Carried. Thank you. Recommendation two, that Council endorses the attached Thai Happy Amenities Building detailed design layout. Moving, Councillor Gordon, Councillor Hero seconding. Um, any questions? Do you wish to speak to this, Councillor Gordon? No, you wish. I think um, everyone hopefully has read it. Um, it's been canvassed with the uh, user group on a number of occasions. Um, and I think we just have to keep on trucking. Yeah. It's just of a significance. I don't want somebody to come back at me and say, we did not get the opportunity to have a say. Any further speakers? Put it to the vote. Those in favour? No. Those against? Carried. Thank you. Uh, 10.6, the Mangaweka ablutions block. <clears throat> Could somebody move that we receive? Councillor Lambert moving, seconded. Councillor Hira, those in favour? Aye. Carried. <clears throat> the recommendation, somebody would move and you need to delete or... Happy to move to. Council approves. Um, I just to. have a question around this. There are two lots of contingencies being talked about here. Um, one of 16,000 and one of 50,000. So it's, um, could somebody just explain to council the relevance of having two con contingency figures in there? I'll let Jess do that. Yeah, thank you very much. So the contingencies have two different purposes. There is 16,000 that is held within the construction contract with the proposed contractor emits. And that is for known variations that we don't know the cost of yet. They are the moving of the playground to its new location, the relocation of the gas and the pay wave system that will be used. We know we will require them. We've got estimated costs, but they couldn't be finalised in advance. The other contingency, $50,000, is held outside of the construction contract, and that is for completely unknown items that could arise during construction. The kind of things we would expect to see would be um, perhaps a poor area of ground requiring a slight change to a foundation or finding a cable in the vicinity of the foundation that needs to be moved over. 50,000 is for items that may be, uh, may be identified during construction and therefore it is a reasonable amount of budget to allow for those eventuations. Uh, but similarly, we don't know what they are yet. So they're held outside the construction contract. Um, thank you. There seems to be no consideration of the existing block that is there. I'm presuming that it's that we own it, that it's not leased. Um, it is a, a multi-bay um, male and female showers, toilets. It is. 
that has would presumably have a considerable value. Yes. I see no mention in the report around either having that being sold or taken elsewhere. Um, but surely um, this is part of the project and, and an asset to be realised. I always, uh, is it all right if I speak? Uh, so, you. So I hate to split hairs. However, that really is far outside the scope of the project. Uh, you are correct. We own that sort of portable toilet and shower block, like the kind you'd find at a festival perhaps. Um, but the what happens to that is outside the scope of constructing the new shower and toilet block. What I will say, though, um, you know, within my role is I have spoken to Gaylene at length about it. We, she, she understands that it has considerable value, and as that asset sits within her realm, effectively, it'll be returned back to her, and Gaylene will either make decisions or come back to council around its ongoing use. We may have, and she has some ideas. We may have places in the district it could be relocated to where it be very well used. She may also recommend that it is sold, but that is quite far outside the scope of a capital works project. I, yeah, I just wonder why it's outside of scope when it is part of the the project and an asset to be realised as part of this project. That's all. That's why I was surprised that it wasn't included in any shape or form. I understand. I think the way that we saw it was, it is an asset that we already own. It is a relocatable asset. So it would, in fact, be picked up and moved somewhere else. And um, the new shower and toilet block doesn't go on the same piece of land. So really, it, it could stay there for another two years, three years or five years, you know, um, with the new one in use next to it. Um, so so while I guess I'm saying it's outside of scope, Gaylene and I have put our heads together about it and she's well across it with the future uses of that building. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it there. Um, bum, bum, bum. Councillor Wilson, you moved. Yep, um, I think Councillor Carter. No, who's Lam Lambert, I think it was. Um, no, maybe. We'll put Councillor yeah. Lambert in there yeah. as well. Do you wish to speak to it? Uh, yeah, very quickly, look, another delayed project. Um, this It's been around this um, council table before, <coughs> delayed due to the construction of the Mangawiki Bridge. Um, very pleased to see it back up and, and running. So let's move on. Any speakers to it? Put the vote. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. The next recommendation around approving or not approving uh, the addition of the further $50,000 contingency to this project, increasing the budget project budget to 425000 etc. I'm happy to move that. Chair of Assets, Secret. Chair of Finance moving, seconding. Um, do you wish to speak to it? I think it's been clarified by, um, by Jess in the operations there. Right, I will put it to the vote. Those those in favour? Those against? Carried, thank you. May we please go to 11.3 worship to release Mr Jones and then we can go to public exclusive if that's convenient. Thank you. Mr Jones, I'm sorry we've kept you um, sitting there. I'm sure you've del been delighted in the conversation. <laughs> But if you would like to take us through the roading program 2124 confirmation, please. Um, yes. I've got the program on Excel. Do you want to shine that on the screen? Yeah, is that possible? Certainly. Mm. That would be easier. Where is it? Where is it? My pocket. Oh. Oh. Not off the crease. Um, excuse me, page number, please. One four zero. Oh, 
Start talking, John, and I'll share it. I can't. You can't? I can't. It's, there's a lot of ups and downs and ins and outs. Well, perhaps while that's going on, Dave, can you or Arno just introduce the concept of the paper and why it's in here? Absolutely. Uh, if I may, oh, there you go. There you go. Oh, right. So. We've put the budget to NZTA. Yeah, I'm just trying to get it. It's all right. Last August, so over a year ago. Um, with the initial bid, we do a program business case with all the evidence to support what we want as per their instructions, which is all this work. And right, we'll be back. It's, it's tired. So they had a look at that, and then they said, "Oh, you have to reduce it by whatever." So we reduced it, and that became our initial bid. Then they played with it for a while. So that was the initial bid. So that was. Probably December. So is that, that's the summary one, is it? Yes. So can you shrink it a bit? I do, but then it, um, all then the figures, it. no, the figures disappear, see? Yeah, that's fair enough. Mm. It's quite a monster of a thing, and this is the summary. Um, so I'll read for my little bit of paper. So, maintenance, operations, and renewals, you know what I mean by that? So that's the day to day maintenance. Yeah. Us, yeah. So, that's the business as usual. That went in and then was reduced over the three years. And the variation was 2.3 million less for maintenance, operations, and renewals. And then we come to the improvements. And this gets interesting. So the road improvements, they wanted it split into various categories, uh, replacement of bridges and structures, road improvements, um, resilience improvements. And then they had a priority list called road to zero, so we've got that. And then walking and cycling and cycling facilities. So all the projects for all of those things went into those categories. So then two weeks ago, after a lot of silence, they said, here's a program. So they didn't approve any of the walking and cycling. They reduced the road to zero from one point for well, for this year, 1.5 million went down to 345,000. And then all the other stuff, they just lumped it into one category, um, road improvements. So we just got a long figure. So within their system, they've got TOs and online systems, huge, pages and pages of it. They've got all the list of programs, and then they've got the final amounts of money that they approve. But we found out yesterday they hadn't aligned all the program that was in it with the amounts of money 
that had been approved. So there was walking and cycling stuff shown in the big long list as approved, but in the front end of it where they actually give the money, walking and cycling was not approved. So, so as I understand it, what's happened here is I thought there was a contestable, uh, there was a phrase that came out that the, a certain amount of money could be released as contestable at one of the meetings I was at. So I then said, how do we, uh, I went to um, Linda Stewart and said, how do we, does that exist? How do we apply? Because we don't seem to have been funded for the bridge between Hereford and, on Hereford Street between the two schools. She came back and then said, yes, it has been approved. Yeah, what and she did, she didn't know. So she went to Rob Service, who is the guy in Palmerston North, who went into the one part of TO, which, had, which I just described, which is all the list of projects. And they had some that were approved and not approved. But that list has not been adjusted to their final approval. And I spoke to Rob and he said, he's deeply sorry, there is a disconnect and they're working on it. And I said, so if there is a project that's near and dear to council's heart, can we reprioritize the list? And he says, I'll get back to you. So we're waiting on that. So it could be a negotiated thing. Yeah, I've got some other questions relating to all this. Okay. In a so, so to summarise, if I may, uh, when this paper was written, we knew that we'd have changing funding from NZTA for our various roading programmes. Yeah. I asked the team to provide the impact both in terms of uh, finances and projects. Um, the, the table that was in the paper of the projects that were no longer funded was accurate at the time. What John is now saying is that there is confusion even amongst NT NZTA. Right. So I would um, ask for you to um, perhaps, at your, at your um, um, okay, your worship, that the paper be received, but note that you'd like a further update on the anomalies that have been identified since the paper has been um, released to you. Yeah. So what we're working on because we've only had this like for two weeks. So those are the ups and downs on the various funding categories. If you go down a bit. Keep going. So this is a road improvements. We put all these figures in. Four point. Two million. They just give a lump sum at the end. That's the approved. So it's 500,000 more. The road to zero was one and a half million. They've given us 345,000. And that's for safer journeys for schools. That's um, active warning signs. Walking and cycling, we had the walking and cycling in <coughs> Road to Zero, because we that was a priority thing. They said, no, put it in walking and cycling. So we put it in walking, walking and cycling, and then they didn't give us anything. Yeah, um, my concern around this roading program um, is quite high. And the reason I have the concern is prior to an LTP, you put out a proposal to, to Waka Katahi for approval funding. Yes. Just, and then immediately before the LTP was signed off, they removed seven million over three years, or that order of money. 5.4. Yeah. So let's, okay, let's say. A, a lot of money. A lot of money. It's, let's say five million is removed or a couple of million dollars a year effectively. Yeah. We then adjusted our LTP on that basis. Yep. So we struck a rates position on that basis. Then subsequently, after our LTP was um, approved and embedded, they had then come back to us and said, well, actually, government has had a re-look at this, and we're now prepared to give a whole chunk of that money back. 
Not all of it. You haven't told us any of that. Well, that's, that's the message that I get, um, that the government has put money back into the pot, right. prioritising um, maintenance and other issues. Yep. So we, we're talking to our investment advisor, which is Rob Service of Palmerston North, and he's got no information on this whatsoever. Um, and it's, the instructions he's got is those bottom lines are what you get, and you've got to work within them. This is, but what I'm getting at, why I think this is a total shambles, is because the government has given us the indication that they are putting money back into the pot and it will be redistributed back to councils. And we're yet to be advised. Yep. Now, the problem with that is we have struck a rate position. Now, I've gone to Waka Kotahi and said, presumably that will be on a far rate basis, and they've said yes. So you're getting money back and on a fire rate basis. So we can use it, but effectively, we have to find money to resource our 37, our 47% or whatever it is, yeah. 53, 100 minus 50, uh, 63. Five-ish. Yeah, 40, yeah, 47. So we now have to add, if we're going to use the money that's going offered back under a fire rate basis, mm. that is effectively unfunded budgets within our LTP. But before you even get to that point, the only um, certainty we've got at the moment is that figure. Now, if I could just finish. Yeah. We've got the projects that we put forward in this. We now have to go through it, and we'll be, by next council meeting, you can have one of these, which is the reconfigured suit that budget and you'll have that now that's what you've got if they eventually give you more money i doubt it you can either take it if you can afford the local share or not okay there are several issues here one is you're dead right if you can afford the local share yeah. and we haven't budgeted for that within our system Secondly, that if they're giving money back, then we would have to, the council would have to re-approve the asset management plan for roading. Yeah, well, so that part. You would have to come back with a variation and say, um, this is what you've agreed to, councillors. This is where we would like it, our view as to where we would like it supplemented. This is where we're at. As I say, I've got to update this to align it with that budget. I'm working on that at the moment, so it'll take them another couple of weeks. When they've got that, we can then finally present this to council and say, this is the programme business case as it stands at that date. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the way that I said this, uh, Mr. Jones, is, um, you know, absolutely you're doing the right thing. I don't have any qualms about that. But the system is in a total shambles yes, I agree. at the moment. Yes. And, you know, they are the government is telling us one thing. I sit on the regional transport boards and we are told these things. Um, uh, and yet there are no systems to be able to, do, to handle it. And I am concerned that the impact on us, you know, so and I've been told all of this that you know you should approve this as they normally did by about Christmas so that you then have your six months to do your LTP. Not this year, it come after the fact. So we're in the position we're at, we're at now. And multiply this by 67 councils. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, the arguments are probably being lost around this table because they are so convolu convoluted, but uh, it is really, really concerning to me as to where this sits. You want to be on the receiving end of this and try and make sense out of it? Yeah. I'm not sure that I can sort of offer a solution here, Mr Chief Executive, but no, other I... than to highlight my concern. I think that's been done, Your Worship. Yeah. Yep. So, 
in a couple of weeks' time. Darren Black is working on this now. I think he's adjourned to Cooks. Um, and when, when we've reconciled that and we've got a list of projects, then we can bring that back to council and you can have a look at it. And then if there's something you don't like, then life's no negotiation will go back to Waka Kotaki and say, we'd like to reprioritize this list and in this order and see what happens. Yeah, I get the feeling they're quite likely to say, oh, we'll do your bridge and shut up. <laughs> That's you know, highly likely. And, and I'm not joking about that. I know. I know, I know what, and this, has this been recorded? Yes. Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah. Yeah. May I wish to get the recommendation, Your Yeah. Um, so would somebody like to move it, re receive the report as it is? Old, old move. Sorry. No, no. unless you're taking someone online. No, excuse me, can, can, you, can I have a question? Um, sorry, thank you. Uh, I just, uh, given the confusion around this report and everything, I, I would like reassurance that we can receive this report. Um, you're receiving it as the report that we have at this moment in time, essentially, Councillor. Um, I've raised a number of questions around it. The staff are going to have to do a lot of work around this. Um, and I suspect Waka Katahi will be burning overnight hours trying to resolve these issues. Maybe, maybe not. So, Councillor Belsham's moving, seconded. I'll second. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. Yeah. Well, should, could we just note on this one, because, and, and, and I'm mindful of the time, but as this is a public document that we're looking at here, the following walking and cycling programs will now not be funded. Um, I would like to express somewhere in this order paper a huge amount of disappointment in that, given where all those walking and cycling projects are. And I understand the reason, John, Yeah, and your explanation is fine. But And it's a government policy yeah. statement priority. Yeah, walking yeah. And, and that's right. And these were several things that we had people come into these chambers and discuss with us in our LTT process, uh, significant to our community, and I think it should be noted um, some a, a high level of disappointment in this, given the fact that these are walking and cycling projects. I would suspect one option you may wish to consider, Councillor, is that you um, need urgent clarification around this, the status of this. So we will be trying to make sense of what they've given us and align it with this. And during that time, I will be liaising with Waikikotahi in this regard and the walking and cycling and particularly the one that seems to be a high priority and see what can be achieved. Yeah. So do you wish to put some words around this? I, I don't, I, I'm suddenly just thinking here that I would endorse the, the Chief Executive and or the Mayor to support John and Stephen in any such way with whatever words they need to 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 support the position. I don't know if there's a motion or recommending or if it's an undertaking, but I think we should really be having yeah, something. Okay, oh. look, I'll move that um, the Rangitaki District Council uh, urgently requires clarification around um, the roading budgets. Full stop. Got your bottom line. Yes. Yeah, I'll second. Um, oh, no, I'm going to speak to it further. Tied up enough time here, I think. Um, those in favour? No. no. Those against? Carried. Thank you. Councillors will take. Um, Should we move into public excluded? Are we going to public excluded? Yeah. That yes, would be we great. Will. Could we do that? Would now? somebody like to move that we move into public excluded for the reasons given? Uh, Councillor Carter and Councillor Ash, was it? Yes. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. Um, so thank you for those that have had the perseverance to um, to watch this all the way through. I congratulate you. And we'll adjourn for 10 minutes. Yes, and we need to use, you'll use the other link that you were sent for public excluded. Yeah.